I prefer to remain completely anonymous, since I'm one of the few people still involved in the traditional moonshine trade of the South. Believe it or not, it is still a thing. You just don't see as much of it as you used to. Law enforcement tends to turn a blind eye these days, and a big part of the draw of the whole thing was making money off something you weren't supposed to be doing. But anyway, this story happened when I was barely 13, and the law had hauled away enough of the family to make a good dent in our moon shining. Living in the mountains just wasn't protecting us like we had hoped. So, the older guys decided it was time to teach me what they knew, so that I could step up and help out with the family business. Worst case scenario, I know how to make money if I ever ended up by myself and keep me and my siblings fed. They showed me how to rig up a moonshine, still out of anything, including old car parts. They showed me how to grow the grain and make it into a mash. I supposed back in the day, I got the equivalent of a college education from those old kinfolk. But in the process, the old family tale took on a whole new dimension of reality. They emphasized that if there was anything, anything that I should not let slide, it was leaving out some fresh moonshine for tall Charlie. And it better be fresh. If it's more than 12 hours old, he wouldn't have it. And the drink had to be offered on the old signal hill, on the petrified tree stump, on the night of each new moon. All of my life, I had heard my family saying things like, buy tall Charlie's whiskers, and Charlie take you, and other superstitious sounding stuff. I think the best one was giving someone a Charlie gift, something you gave to the wife when she was mad at you. I just went with the flow, being surrounded by that talk all my life. I guess I filled tall Charlie away in some pigeonholes as Santa Claus. But there's all the old men in the family standing over me, with crazy wide eyes, telling me how important it is to leave out a fresh nip for tall Charlie. Part of me just couldn't take them seriously. I think they picked up on it, and they grew stern with me for days. I heard Charlie's name so many times. It's a wonder my ears did not bleed. So, I humored them. I got into the full swing of making liquor, and I was the first to make sure that tall Charlie got his share. I personally took it to the old Signal Hill myself. I won't lie. The place had a funny way about it at night, during a new moon, when you couldn't see a thing. About a year went by of me doing all this, and by the time I was 14, I was asking some rational questions. Each time I went up to the Signal Hill with a new drink, the old one was gone. Unless there was a bear or raccoon that liked getting sauced. It was the work of some living person for sure. One new moon, I decided it was time to bring some food and something to sleep on, because I wanted to see which one of my family or whoever, was making the trip to get a little bit of moonshine from the Signal Hill. It had to have been family. I thought all that witchy offerings and sacrifices were done during full moons. Why the new moon, when you have a slim chance of being seen and identified? It was just too convenient. So, I set down the offering on the stump, and I hid back behind the big old fallen tree, and I covered up my lantern so I wasn't this obvious blob of light. I started to doze when I heard movement. I uncovered the lantern and sprang out into the open like I was going to arrest somebody. I really, really should have been more cautious. And there was a figure leaning over to take the drink. That had to have been the tallest outline of a person I had ever seen in my life. And that was all I could see. An outline. 
the body of the thing seemed to absorb light, making it a shadow. My lantern lit up most things around it, but not the person itself. There were two points of light, like pearl marbles, and they gazed through me as it turned its head to see who was interrupting its moment with the drink. Then, there were other points of light when it showed its teeth. I supposed it could have been a smile. Felt more like a territorial snarl. I didn't stick around to find out. I cut out of there pretty quickly, and I'm pretty sure I pissed down my leg while I was running away. So, I don't travel too far from my homestead. I've lived close all my life to make sure Charlie gets his drinks on time, every time. I'm a professional landscape photographer, and about two, three years ago, during the winter months, I was out in the state of Colorado, higher up in the mountains, shooting some shots and traveling on different locations to find the best shots to get. This happened when I was traveling to a destination in the mountains. I was going up a rather large hillside when I discovered, to my right, were two large, upright, tall, and black humans, or humanoid persons, carrying a large dead buck. There was one in front, who had its front legs, and one in back, carrying its back legs. It was most certainly dead, and unfortunately, my camera and my tripod were all put away and in my backpack. They were gone in just a matter of a few seconds faster than I would ever have time to pull out my camera and get a good shot. Not to mention, these figures were also several hundred yards away, enough that I could see that they were persons, but there's two main reasons why I suspect they were not humans, and something else. My speculation being Bigfoot. Number one, I'm up here in a very remote, desolate area in the mountains. There shouldn't really be people around and it wasn't hunting season that I was aware of. Number two, they moved very fast, and even from my distance, they were all black, like pitch black. Plus, their size in comparison to the dead buck, which I could see from my distance was rather large, something did not seem right, and I think that was my very first time ever seeing Bigfoot up here in the Rockies. I live in a corner of the mountains of West Virginia that the world seems to have forgotten about. I don't know if they did that on purpose, or if they just haven't sent enough people out here to truly document things. I found out the hard way that you are lucky to be alive if you come out here and you don't know what you are getting yourself into. I'm lucky to be alive myself. My story started when I was 17, and I was just about as wild as any boy could be. You couldn't exactly go to a bar to find fresh meat to grill for the night, but there were plenty of young girls among our so-called God-fearing families that were just as wild as I was. You just had to know how to meet them when their parents weren't around, and yours weren't around at the same time. At the time, I had met the wildest little mountain flower I have ever laid eyes on, and she seemed to think just as highly of me. Her eyes kind of turned black when she looked at me. We didn't waste any time in figuring out when she and I could spend some solo time alone. Her paw must have caught wind that she was falling for a loose boy, because she was set that she had to come to me, and it wouldn't be good if I came to her. I lived with my grandparents, who were well on their own way to being blind and deaf, so I had made it. She and I, in our time together, as much as we pleased in a treehouse I had built. Nobody knew about the place except me and the girls that I took there. You can only do so much boinking there before you're interested in really talking. I didn't have any interesting stories for her besides the fact that I'd been forbidden all my life 
from playing around what Grandma called the sandy part of the mountains. Even as a young adult, I got told pretty regular that I should not go there. She was a daredevil and wanted to see the sandy parts. I was surprised at how afraid I was to actually overstep that boundary. I never had. I could overstep all kinds of bounds with girls, but not going to the sandy parts. So I sucked it up, and I agreed that we'd go the next time we were together. The sandy parts weren't all that sandy. They were just rough, and not much grew there. Lots of gravel rock in the soil that only hardy, scrubby plants could handle. It also seemed unusually dry. Though the rain fell there as much as it did anywhere else. I was watching a fox looking for bugs, thinking about how foolish I must have looked, being so spooked by an arbitrary rule my elders came up with. I had not seen a single thing to watch out for. My girl called me over to look at something around a bunch of half-buried boulders. There were two things she was checking out. There were deep scratch marks in the boulders, the kind that are made by hours of scraping. There were also what looked to be recent blood stains, but it was also dried, so it was that rusty color. I was able to convince myself that it was something else. I heard a painful yelp over yonder, and we went to see what it was. There wasn't much left of the fox that I saw earlier. The tail was a bloody stump, and shreds of skin had been flung everywhere, sticking to the faces of the rocks. Bad as that was, it bothered me even more how quickly that had taken place. I eyeballed the ground for footprints, but nothing. I was pretty well spooked, but my girl was more fascinated than anything else. She starts babbling about going on a whole monster hunting expedition to see what was lurking in the sandy parts. Something about her, the way it made me afraid, and I wanted her to get to safety. That just made her mad, like she was a wild bird resisting being caged. I wondered if that's how her parents felt when they found out about me. All of a sudden, we were having a pretty bad argument over the entire thing. That's when I made the biggest mistake that I could have made. I stomped off in anger and left her there. I wasn't gone long. I sat under a tree for about 30 minutes, somehow accidentally dozing off. I came to and noticed that she had not found me. I went back over to the sandy parts. And that's pretty much where my life ended, in a very real way. Remember what I said about the fox? It was the same with my girl. Her blonde hair was flung every which way. Human bones picked clean, strewn all over like garbage. The prettiest girl I'd ever knew was treated like litter. I was hot, let me tell you. And I may revenge a personal matter. I hung out alone in the sandy parts, waiting for whoever or whatever was there, and I had my hatchet ready every waking minute. But the murderer never showed. Once, and only once, I thought I saw something like a long insect leg poking out from a rock, as if the rock were some sort of shell, and that leg was longer than a cat's tail. I looked that rock over, tried even smashing it, but nothing. I never found out what was killing and eating when I wasn't watching. I did the right thing and got the police involved. And no matter how bad I looked, miraculously, they didn't put me away for it. Part of me wanted them to, but they did not have enough to pin it on me. That was either the most honest set of cops in the world, or another degree of cruelty on the part of the thing that would kill and eat everybody but me. 
like its will extended to leaving me with the worst possible guilt. So, there you have it. If you find yourself in the mountains where it's all dry and rocky, and animals are disappearing, then do yourself a favor and leave while you still can. My story takes place back in 2012 when I hiked Camelback Mountain in Arizona. During this day, it was pretty dead, and Camelback Mountain is usually pretty full of people. You're not far from civilization, so it's not like you're out in the boondocks. It's a pretty well-traveled area. I just think this day, I was the only person on this section of trail that I could see behind me and ahead of me. If you don't know what the trail is like, it's not dirt or surrounded by trees. It's pretty much a straight rocky path up. Boulders and rocks everywhere, with all sorts of mountain Arizona brush around. At one point or another, I was starting to feel a very eerie sensation, like I should just turn around and leave. Unsure of why I was feeling that, I subsided my feelings and just paid no attention, paid no mind to such ridiculous feelings. I wasn't about to turn back, until, directly ahead of me, I saw the largest coyote crouching behind some brush, and it appeared to be watching me. I instantly knew it was a coyote, due to its coloring and shape of face. I mean, if you know what a coyote looks like, then you know. Except, even from the distance it was at, I could tell it was much larger than any regular coyote. That's when I kept walking toward it, not thinking too much and just thinking how weird it was, when all of a sudden, this coyote stood up as if to stop me from coming toward it. And then, when it stood up, all hell in my mind broke loose. When I say it stood up, I mean just like a person, two legs, and I saw that its body was just like that of a hairy man. Chest, arms, legs, everything about it besides the head was human, but covered in fur that resembled a coyote's fur. Because of the brush and rocks, I couldn't really see any hands or feet, but it was enough for me to know that this was something of another world potentially a shapeshifter or a skinwalker, like I've heard about in tales before. But I thought that was only a Navajo thing, or a Native American thing. And this all happened in my mind within a few seconds of seeing this thing. That's when I turned around, and I fled down the trail. It never followed me, but it's a reason why I don't go back and hike on Camelback Mountain anymore. Now that so many years have passed, and I've got to expand upon my knowledge of the area and things of the area. I truly believe it was somebody, a native, I think, who was wearing a coyote skin and had the ability to take its shape and form, or a shapeshifter, as you call it. That's what I believe. The coyote, or person, even though when it fully stood up, wasn't any more taller than I, and I'm six foot even, and even I can tell you when it stood up on two legs, it was a threatening posture, like it was getting ready to meet me face to face, like it felt threatened, and not like it was going to run off. Why this person, or thing, or coyote, was crouched down behind the brush watching me, I'm not sure. It's possible it had been there for a while, and I had just come on that side of the trail, and this thing saw me coming. And then I saw it, and it didn't know what to do. So many possibilities. But to be honest with you, I don't have an answer at all. I'm just merely guessing. But what I know for sure is I encountered something on that day. Something that wasn't entirely human. I was in the Rockies, working as a consensus man of all things. You'd be amazed at the theories and misconceptions people have about me and what I do in my line of work. I'm a government spy. 
I'm a criminal, posing as a government employee. I'm actually counting people on behalf of the USSR, instead of the US, and so on. So I was a little more than dog food with legs, as far as the mountain people were concerned. I had one house to go, and then I could get out of those godforsaken mountains. I prayed that they were home, halfway friendly, and didn't have large dogs. As far as mountain homes went, it was something of a mansion, just a very rustic one. Also, the property seemed to be sprawling. I felt like I had stumbled onto the land of one of the oldest and biggest families in the mountains. Knocking on the imposing front door got me nothing but silence. I made it a point to knock loudly, just in case there was a dog on the property and he would give himself away, barking at the disturbance. There was no such reaction. Mountain people weren't known for vacating their homes of anyone and everyone at once, so I wondered if the place was even still lived in. It did not have the abandoned feel to it. There was a truck that looked like it had been in use recently. And there was clean laundry out on the clothesline. So where was everybody? I grew bolder, and I went out to the nearest open structure I could see, the barn. It was so old that most of the red paint had flaked off. It was generously stashed with hay bales, the ceiling high, to the point that it felt like a cathedral instead of a barn. The strange feeling was growing stronger, and I felt like I was being watched. I had been looking up so much that I didn't notice the obvious pile of bones in the center of the barn floor. And there were human skulls glaring at me, so no amount of rationalization would protect me from the fact that people did die here, unnaturally. Even worse, there were still spots of moist pink on the bones, this being all recent work, and no police tape anywhere. I wasn't going to find a phone out there, so I did the next best thing. I took out my old company camera and began taking pictures with the film I had left. I don't know what made me glance up, but I saw something pale and large clinging to the corner where the wall and ceiling met. It had long fingers and toes like that of a frog. Its vertebrae poked from underneath its taut skin. It was hunched, also like a frog, but I could tell that everything about it was long and tall. It could have been a trick of the shadows, but it looked like it didn't have much of a face, other than three black eyes arranged in a pyramid formation. There was nothing to indicate a mouth or nose. I reacted on instinct, and I ran. I felt the impact of the creature in my feet as it leapt down from its perch. I could tell that it was closing in on me with blinding speed. I suppose there's a one in a million chance of surviving anything, and the odds decided to be in my favor that day. I could hear it behind me, gaining quickly. I timed it in my head when I guesstimated that it would make the killing pounce. I dove at a perpendicular angle to the truck I had passed before. It shouldn't have worked, but the monster kissed the grill of the truck full force. I glanced over my shoulder to see its shape slump off to the side. It was stunned at least, and I prayed that was enough time for me to make it to my own vehicle. My lungs were burning, and my out-of-shape body was begging for me to stop running. I almost gave in when I heard the scampering of the creature behind me again. It was closing in faster this time, and it must have been furious. The instant that I had shut my car door and locked it, the creature had thrown its body against the window. I was arrested for a moment by the bottomlessness of those black eyes. That was the first time I noticed that there weren't any eyes in those three sockets. They were just empty holes 
that extended into a darkness that was deeper than the head they sat in. They were as expressionless as the eyes of human skulls, and yet I could feel the boiling rage they seethed. I snapped out of it, jumped over to lock the other doors. No electronic locks. The monster was half a second behind me as it tried each door. Then, it resorted to slapping the glass. I started my car and tried to lunge backwards and run over it, but it was too fast for that. The cab of my car thumped, and my heart pounded so hard that I thought I'd have a concussion from it. The monster was on top of my car. I had visions of the thing clinging to either the top or the bottom of my vehicle, all the way into town, and then finally snapping my neck as soon as I dared to step out of it. I peeled out and looked in my rearview mirror. Nothing. It was still with me. I drove into the nearest town, found the police station, and began honking my horn like crazy. Several officers came out looking confused and annoyed. I put them through the business of checking my vehicle for anything unusual. They thought they were looking for drugs. My heightened state convinced them that I was on something, but they couldn't find anything above or below, so I gradually accepted the idea that the monster had given up at some point. I handed over the camera with its pictures of the carnage at the mountain home. I was never able to find out how far they pursued the case. Even today, I still think I see the thing out of the corner of my eye, still stalking me. If it really is still with me, I wonder what it's waiting for. Maybe it's being cruel and it wants to scare me to death. Maybe I'm mentally scarred and I'm cursed with hallucinations and jumping at shadows. Either way, what I saw was real. What it did to that family was more than real. This was only back in 2019, and when I still think about it, it still scares me. So even writing this is kind of tough. I just would rather forget about it. But I suppose it's best to at least send it to somebody that can use it to help other people who have dealt with similar things. Back in 2019, as I said, I was out camping with my family and several very close friends. Near our campsite, well, not even a campsite, we were kind of out in the woods, so not anywhere at a campground. Back where we were, we had a nice little spot, a clearing, I guess you would call it. Well, come evening time, we saw several deer come to the area. No bucks, just a bunch of doe, blacktail to be exact. Right around sundown, we saw a couple more doe come in. We weren't really paying any attention to them, since we're used to seeing deer all the time where we live, but they are beautiful to look at. After they left the clearing into the woods, we heard a huge giant roar that sounded like a lion, but 20 times bigger and more ferocious, and then crashing in the woods, away from our campsite, as if something was running after those doe. All of my friends and my family, we all heard it, and we were all pale and wide-eyed for the rest of the night, thinking, what on earth did we just hear? A few of my friends suggested it was probably just a mountain lion, and the distortion of being outside made it sound much bigger than it actually was. Except, I'm no fool. There's no way a mountain lion could sound like that. And there's no way a mountain lion would go crashing through the trees. And they're a silent killer. Or at least they try to be. This sounded like a bulldozer, pillaging through the woods. I mean, you could visibly hear trees and branches snapping and breaking. Whatever was going after those doe had to have been massive and very fast, because it led away from that clearing very quickly. I'm pretty glad we never actually had to see what it looked like.
I live near the Ozark Mountains, and there are often lots of strange happenings reported, but I have never experienced something for myself until just a few weeks ago. People go missing all the time, and bodies are found. Strange sightings or sounds are witnessed by hikers, walkers, even kids on trips. I have no explanation whatsoever for what I saw and heard. I've been puzzling it over a few days, and it still makes no sense. I wasn't even out for a walk, or any of the more typical scenarios. I was standing on my back porch, looking at the yard, calling for my cat, actually. It was late evening, and she should have been in by now. It was a real still and quiet evening, and I would have been able to hear her meowing if she was answering my call, like she usually does. Instead of a meow, though, I heard a very distinctive growl, low and quiet, so if I had not been such a still evening, I likely would have picked up on it. Something about it caused me immediate concern for my cat, not for myself, just yet. I called her name again, Buttercup. Still, nothing. But I did get the sense that there was something shifting slowly on the other side of the fence at the back of my yard. At this point, I wasn't afraid. More worried about my cat and that whatever was outside my yard was possibly some sort of predator. I didn't want to scare it off right then, in case it had her. So I crept up to the fence and just listened for a moment. I could for sure hear something behind there, breathing heavily, more like panting and that growl. Because it was late evening and dark, and the fact that I lived near the mountains and not in the middle of a city, there wasn't a ton of light. The moon was giving me some help, but otherwise, the yard was pretty dark. I edged my way along the fence until I got to the gate. Luckily, I'd replaced it fairly recently, so it opened pretty well without making too much noise. Since there had been no sounds from my cat, Buttercup, I thought that I'd check to see what was out there. Not being a complete schmuck, I grabbed the shovel that was next to the gate, just in case it was a coyote or something. I will try to describe what I saw to you. Bearing in mind it was dark, and my eyes were trying to adjust whilst my brain was trying to make sense of the madness. You see, there was something there by the fence, just as I had heard. It appeared to be on all fours as you would expect an animal to be, but the body looked wrong somehow. It was the way its back was arched, and the head was hanging low, despite the fact that I could see through the dark and that it was completely covered in a light-colored hair. It almost looked like a person on their hands and knees, or like when you're a kid and you try to spider walk. It was making that heavy panting and low growl noise as I stared at it. I couldn't see the head properly as it was bent, facing the floor. Again, more like a person than an animal was meant to be in that position. It was just beginning to raise its head when I heard a meow. Looking behind to see me was Buttercup, pressed up against the fence, looking scared. As I bent down to pick her up, I then took my eyes off the thing behind me, just for a moment or two. Just a moment. But, when I turned back, Buttercup, now safely in my arms, the thing was no longer low on the ground. It stood up on two legs. It was as tall as me, and alongside that very hairy body, I finally got to see its face, albeit very quickly, and as I said, it was dark, but the face, it looked human. It then ran, and when I say ran, it was gone in a flash, and so was I, back into the house with my cat, 
locking every door and window that I could find. That was about three weeks ago now. Buttercup is now a house cat exclusively. No way I'm letting her back outside. I have no idea what that thing could have been. But I have heard stories of men who can turn into animals. I just never until now ever believed it could even be a remote possibility. My first ever memory is one of two that I look upon as unexplained. It is a short memory. I think I was about four years old. I know this because at the time, we were living somewhere in New Mexico, and I was in my first ever big girl bed, as in no railings and not a crib. We moved to a different state before I even turned five. My mother maintains that the house we lived in at the time was built on Native American burial grounds. I don't know if this is true, and Mom also reports a lot of paranormal happenings during our four years there. I remember very little. The massive sky, just because the land was so flat, and the white stone gate that surrounded our garden. I don't really have any memories before this time. There are things I know, because of pictures or stories, but this is my first ever living, feeling, terrifying memory. I remember waking up from my sleep in the middle of the night to a low growl. At the end of my bed, the red eyes of a large black dog burned in the darkness, glaring at me as it snarled. But the dog was not quite a dog. It's hard to describe, because it was physically a dog. I could also see a man's eyes staring at me, as if wearing the mask or illusion of a dog, if that makes any sense. I am now 29, but the memory has remained vivid. I remember my pink sheets, the dark room, the red eyes, and terror. I don't remember what happened next, and I assumed for a long time that it was just a really bad nightmare I had as a little girl. I never really mentioned it. I didn't really understand it at the time, and my childhood became pretty complicated soon after. However, when I was about 13, I started telling my mother about it, sort of out of the blue on one of the nighttime bike rides we used to do occasionally to go on together, and she immediately became very animated, as she claimed to have seen the exact same thing in that house at the end of her bed, only she did not think it was a man in a dogskin mask, but just a big black dog with glowing red eyes. About ten years pass, while getting high with one of my brothers, we were talking about supernatural stories, and I brought it up again. He asked me to retell the story, and then told me that it sounded a lot like something he had come across while looking up different tribal beliefs in the Americas. Something called a skinwalker. We spent the rest of the night finding out what we could about them. But there was surprisingly very little info on there about it, beyond a description and few stories here and there. My family settled in the UK a while ago, and we just entered a second lockdown. I'm out of a job, so I find myself with a bunch of free time to chase up on things that I've pushed to the back of my mind. I'm pretty skeptical in general. I think it's likely that I had a nightmare. I had a lot of them as a kid, and still do sometimes like screaming myself awake nightmares, to my embarrassment. However, what makes me take pause is that my mother saw it too. And beyond that, at four years old in the mid-90s, I doubt I ever heard of anything like what I saw. It just seems a little implausible that I would come up with something so closely matching this thing that has been talked about for hundreds of years, and is still talked about today. But, supposing I put my skepticism to one side, three things really bug me. Number one, 
every other story I have ever read about skinwalkers seem to hinge on the fact that they are not able to get into your home. And the story narrator always seems to think that the very worst will happen if they do. Well, mine was totally in the house. Visited two different bedrooms and just snarled, stared, scared us. Number two, if I'm honest, life for my family got pretty hard after that. We were very unlucky. A devastating death. Horrible sudden illness that was never recovered from. Constant drug and alcohol abuse. Attacks on the family and more. Honestly, it was a really bad spiral down. Sometimes I wonder. And number three. I have read in a couple places that you should never lock eyes with one, as it could take control of your body or be absorbed into you. We definitely locked eyes. There was really nowhere else to lock. Being in front of those eyes made me feel like a deer in front of the headlights, frozen, staring right back. So yeah, I have questions. I sort of want to go searching. I sort of want to just forget about it. I sometimes wonder if I'm cursed. My cousins live in some remote, middle-of-nowhere place that could easily feature in a movie, like Deliverance, if it wasn't for the fact that their actual house is kinda nice. Still, their area is handmade for a horror story, and sure enough, they have told me stuff that they've seen and heard, and more recently smelt over the years. The smell part was evidently the worst of the lot. They ended up getting some work eyes in, as of course they assumed there was some practical cause for their smell. Backed up sewage, that kind of thing. But no. Despite being in the middle of nowhere, they take good care of their stuff and there were no issues with pipes or septic tanks. They searched under the house. Maybe a raccoon had died down there, but nothing. It also came and went. The smell wasn't always there, and it didn't seem to have a pattern either. My youngest cousin, Ruby, was still only a kid, around nine or 10, and she had began getting night terrors and only being able to sleep with my aunt, which was kind of draining too. So, aunt asked if I could come down for a few days and help out, since I was home from college for just a bit. Nothing happened those first three days. No smells, no sounds. No one saw any strange shadows, and Ruby was quite content to sleep with me. Despite a ten-year-old age gap, she'd always been like a little sister to me. Then, on the third night, it happened. Ruby woke in a sudden panic, which woke me too. As I was hugging her to calm her, I noticed the smell. It was worse than a public restroom, where the person before you had the stomach flu, added in with some gone-off egg salad and meat that had been left out in the sun all combined. I was trying to calm Ruby, and to not gag myself, when to add to the whole trauma, I heard a voice calling my name. I remember sitting bolt upright, because I hadn't heard the voice for several years. Do you hear anything? I had asked Ruby, and she nodded. What can you hear? I had asked her, and she replied. I hear Nona, calling my name. You hear Nona's voice, I checked. And she is saying your name, Ruby, right? She nodded and continued to bury her head in my arms. Again, I too heard Arnona. Only I heard my name, Chase. I don't think that there is any way to get Ruby and Chase mixed up. Oh, and Arnona. That very distinctive, gravelly voice was both heard by us. She has already been dead for three plus years. I ended up doing some googling that night, long after Ruby had safely drifted back to sleep. 
It was the first time I'd ever witnessed anything. I don't believe in ghosts, necessarily. Not in the way that they can randomly appear. Nona wouldn't leave New York. We always had to travel to see her. She had never been to aunt's. Plus, aside from not wanting to leave her home, she was the nicest old lady we could have all wished for to have as a grandmother. Caring, generous, and kind. A large chunk of my inheritance from her was paying for my college. So I searched for mimicking dead person's voice, awful smell, strange shadows, and even night terrors. You guys are likely all way ahead of me. House in the middle of nowhere. Very likely to have been Native American territory in the past. All the signs point to a Wendigo. When I was in college, I went camping out in the desert with a close buddy of mine who had horses. We fancied ourselves as some kind of cowboys of the old times. I was a city boy, so it was strange, exciting, and a wee bit scary. Especially when he told me about coyotes, how they scream and howl, and can make terrible noises, but they shouldn't come too close to camp. Shouldn't being the word which made it scary. Since I never really stepped foot in the outdoors, I knew nothing. Very naive. I can distinctly remember lying there and hearing the noise. I was glad he had warned me about it, or I think I would have jumped on the horse and got out of there while I still could. It was disturbing and unsettling enough when I knew what the sounds were. Of course, he had promised me that they wouldn't come close, that we wouldn't hear the howling, snuffling, sniffing, and what sounded like one peeing on the side of the tent. Just stay still, he ordered, when I was literally shaking in fear. They're just being nosy, marking their territory. And I tried. Maybe would have been okay if it wasn't for the horses. They were tethered next to the tent, aside from a few disgruntled whinnies. They hadn't kicked up too much of a fuss, until now. Now, they started neighing and snorting, and we could hear them struggling and kicking as they were trying to break free. My buddy suddenly produced a gun that I had no idea he'd even brought, and a flashlight, although it was incredibly light out, considering we were miles from any kind of roads or houses. He said he just let off a warning shot to scare them, but first he wanted me to go to the horses as they would be spooked by the noise. Before this can happen though, we saw the coyote. Now as I've already told you, I'm a city boy through and through. The closest I'd come to any kind of wild animal was the zoo. I remember seeing a deer for the first time and how amazing that was. I know, please, if you're a country person, try not to laugh. I was scared enough thinking this was a regular wild beast, with teeth and claws, and no sense of right and wrong. If it attacked us, it was bad. If it attacked the horses, it was equally bad, as we would have a hell of a trek back. But even me as an amateur and all things in nature knew what I was now seeing was in no way natural. The coyote, if you could call it that, to start with was huge. Giant. I'm talking supersized. When it saw us come out of the tent, it reared up on its hind legs, so it was like a coyote-type man standing there. My buddy, being a good old country boy, shot at it right away, spooking the horses. He pumped around four or five shots into that thing, and it just stood there, as if the bullets went straight through it, or it just wasn't being bothered. The horses were now going crazy. My buddy just stood there, looking shocked that this thing wasn't even being affected by the bullets. And then, it just gave an almighty howl, ran off on two legs, but quicker than I have ever seen any sort of man or creature move. After it was gone, we didn't say anything for quite some time. 
we were successful in calming the horses and going back to the tent. He stayed by the flap with it open, gun close in hand all night. As soon as it was light enough, we packed up, rode home. No questions asked. Once we were back and settled the horses, I asked him what that thing was. What had we seen last night? I had never seen him look so scared. Then, he proceeded to tell me about an old legend that he had heard, since he was just a boy, but never believed it could be true. What he told me was something about a were-coyote. This was apparently a man who had made some sort of pact with black magic practicers, who would grant him the power to shapeshift and change into an animal that he first killed, and then wore the skin of. He didn't need the full moon, or for it to even be nighttime. As long as he wore the skin, he would turn. But as with all the powers over years, the man would become more beast than human, and would spend hours roaming the deserts, hunting, as an animal would, stuck in that constant half-life of part man, part beast. He was certain that that's what we had seen last night. I just don't know. It seems so unbelievable. And yet, I had seen that thing with my own two eyes, witnessed it being shot full of lead, and also, it racing away quicker than the speed of light. Something really terrifying. Something really terrifying happened to me just a few days ago. I really wanted to share it to see if anyone might be able to explain to me what on earth I saw. I usually don't post on here often, so I'm hoping that anybody can answer my question. Anybody with experience in this sort of thing. I was in the woods, walking my dog as usual. Something I do all the time, and have for years. Same woods, same trail... Same walk. Sometimes we see deer there, and my dog could not care less. He never really bothers chasing them. A lazy son of a gun, to be honest. Sometimes, though, the woods can smell kind of funky. I mean, it is a giant toilet for nature, and there are patches of stagnant water around, which, thank God, my dog has no interest in drinking out of. You also find the dead bird, or a creature. But this time, it was like all those things mixed together and amplified by a thousand. To add to the stench, which was actually eye-wateringly bad, the dog began acting more like a wimp than usual, whining, wrapping itself around my legs. I'm not too cruel, but he clearly needed to go and do his business. Otherwise, there would be an unwanted present for me on the way home. So, I tried to shake him off, and get him to at least go, and sniff some trees to go get in the zone. I heard some crunching, coming from right behind us. Like something stepping on the leaves and twigs on the ground floor. As I said, there's ample wildlife in here. So I wasn't too worried, until I turned around to see what was there. By now, the dog was shaking. He was in between my legs and trembling so much. My own body was vibrating. The smell was even worse now, too, and I had to put my hand over my nose and breathe through my mouth. Then, I saw what was behind us. It was like a deer, but although I knew instinctively that it was not a deer, I couldn't really think exactly what else it could be. It was much bigger than even a stag, and had the most magnificent yet terrifying antlers. The whole body of the deer looked wrong. Very thin, fragile, gaunt, and starving. Gray in color, and parts of the fur actually looked as if they were hanging off its body. My first thought, because I tried convincing myself that this was normal, and it was indeed a stag, and possibly diseased and sick, which would account for the smell and bits of apparent flesh. However, two very distinct things happened next, which are the reasons I'm telling you my story, and not having reported the creature to any other authority. Number one, 
This thing proceeded to stand up on two legs. I looked over at my dog. It was clearly looking right at my dog. And I'm actually grateful for that. Number two. This is really messed up. I still don't know for certain this even happened because, well, it sounds so whack. And the only witness was the dog. He can't tell me if I was just hallucinating at this point. But I swear to you, this thing spoke or knew my name. I swear that when it stood up like a person, staring at the dog, it spoke my name. You can bet I hightailed it out of there, dragging my dog with me, but only after a few seconds. Something he never does. But only after a few seconds, that dog was dragging me as we raced back to the opening and jumped back in the car. I jumped in. The dog got in the front. Something he never does. Something I never allow. I just needed to get far away from here. Can you help me? I've barely slept since this happened. My poor dog. I don't think I will ever be able to step foot onto that trail or those woods again. How did this thing know my name? How could it talk to start with? I just need some answers. Please, can someone tell me what that thing was? The plain spoken events of my story won't make much sense without a little bit of context. So, please, bear with me. I have been close to my grandmother my entire life. I could tell there was something different about her when I was just a little girl. I just didn't know what it was. As I grew up, I found out it was several things. One of them was that she was a proud woman, and she wore our family's Native American heritage more than everyone else did. The second was that she was not afraid of practicing the magic of our ancestors. She had all kinds of wards and daily rituals that she kept by clockwork, and apparently it worked, because I always remembered her being something of a mystical figure from my childhood, like someone out of a storybook. Do you remember having anyone from your childhood whom you just felt better as soon as you saw them? Everything about them made you feel better, and you felt that at any moment they could lead you off to a world of wonder and beauty. That's how I felt about my grandmother. I would eventually find out that she didn't keep up her practice of magic for the sake of her heritage. But, for the time being, it was enough to see it as just a part of her sticking to her identity. The memory of a child is far from perfect. But I swear, the woman never aged. She looked the same way when I was a toddler as she did the last time I ever saw her before she would pass away a month later. Now, there was someone else in my childhood that was the exact opposite of my grandmother. Someone that when I saw him and heard him, I felt apprehensive, uncomfortable, and tense. I hope none of you can relate to that. That person was my very own uncle. Never had a criminal record to speak of. Neither did he have a bad reputation he just had this miasma of badness hanging off of him. He would try to hug me and hold me like any of the other relatives, but it was like magnets with the same charge. When he got close, I was compelled to get away. He had less and less of the effect on me as I grew up, but it never went away. It was quite a puzzle to my maturing mind because the older we get, the more we're taught to explain things in concrete terms, which I might add is how the death of childhood magic happens. At last, but not least, I swear the man would not stop looking at me. He didn't exactly stare, but he did seem to always look for just a few seconds longer than he ought to, but not long enough for me to get fed up and call him out. So she passed away and as many members of the family made the trip down to be present for the funeral as possible. Again, she being a proud woman, she never left the res. Much of the accommodations that were within my family's personal price range 
were either in or near the desert, along desolate highways. We ended up in a single-story hotel, where the only thing you could see outside that suggested civilization was the asphalt. The rest was sand and cacti. My parents could tell that I wasn't exactly taking my grandmother's passing very well, so they spent the extra money and let me have my own room. Some people find the company of others soothing during times of grief. I'm the opposite. And that's when the night came, and something happened. It was knocking that was so soft that it could have been mistaken for the sound of some part of the building expanding. But it got louder, gradually increased. There was no way that it was a tree tapping the building. There weren't any trees on the property. It eventually became so loud that there was a definite intention behind it. It was the rhythm that my grandmother used to drum out on the bathroom or bedroom door to make sure if it was okay for her to enter. I wasn't entirely asleep, nor was I fully awake. But I knew it. I knew it was morning. I remembered what I heard, but it was easy to write off as a dream. We went to the funeral service, and it was every bit as dismal and heavy as I expected. We filed by her casket, and she looked like the embalmers hadn't even touched her. The magic she had practiced when she was alive seemed to have a preserving effect on her. Seeing her look like herself was the only bright spot in the entire matter. There was one other thing that stood out as unusual. My uncle, her son, took the liberty of stroking her cheek. And then he did something that happened so quickly, I wasn't sure if I'd actually seen it. When he drew his hand back to himself, there was a slight tick of the wrist, as if he either had an involuntary twitch or he had plucked a single hair from her head. I was sure that I had seen the hair between his fingers, but it was over before I could verify any suspicions. We decided to stay one more night. The whole thing was much more exhausting than we ever expected. That following night went the same as the one before. I slept on my own, and that knocking happened again while I was in a twilight state of being awake. It didn't shake me like it did the last time. So, I was about to drop back down into dreamless sleep when I heard my grandmother's voice come from the other side of the door. It wasn't just her voice. She was saying my name. She was asking if she could come inside. By that point, I was now fully awake, and my heart was pounding out the rhythm of the feet of a fleeing rabbit. There was a pause when I was not answering. And then, the voice on the other side began to whistle. That's when I knew that I wasn't being visited by my grandmother. That's when I held perfectly still and did everything I could not to breathe. I think most of you can tell where this is going. No, I never found out for sure if it was my uncle or not, but that's the working conclusion that I've arrived at. No, I never found out for sure if my uncle was a skinwalker, although he would have been in the environment necessary to discover the lore and the magic behind how to become one. I did find out much later that my own grandmother had been so steeped in Native American magic due to a deeply personal fear of skinwalkers, and I don't remember seeing my grandmother and my uncle in the same room together, ever. There's a story to be heard in there somewhere, for sure, and it's a story that I seem to have been along with for a paragraph or two but it's a story that I'm not sure I exactly want to hear. I worked in a foster home, and I'm proud to say that it's not the kind of place that generates the horror stories you hear about. It's located in Arizona, and the place's reputation is pristine. They may not be able to magically conjure good parents for some of these kids out of thin air, but... As long as the kids 
are under their jurisdiction. They are very much cared for, and we did everything in our power to make sure they felt loved. The founder built the place with the attitude of what if the child never gets adopted? How do you make them feel okay if nobody wanted them? Simple. You run a good foster home, and you run it the way you would run a good family. Look, I'm not trying to throw a sales pitch. I'm just trying to give you the context of my story. It's my understanding that many of the creatures that appear in the accounts on your show are drawn to negativity, bad things, bad places. It's that much more puzzling to me that I have a story to tell, since, honestly, negativity was not a part of this place's history. Now, I'm not going to tell you that we were in any way perfect. We did have one kidnapping, and since then, the security and supervision protocol had been made tighter. Even in spite of those steps, a child accidentally got left outside when she decided she was going to hide from the staff when it was time to corral everyone inside. If she had not been sobbing so loudly, she may have never been found. I myself was present for that incident, and it's probably an additional factor in me having this story to tell in the first place. We have a playground that's bigger than most, and you will find at any school. It's a testimony to how much our founder wanted the children that spend time with us to be so comfortable. The time it takes to get everyone off the playground and double check that no child is left outside is a long and drawn out process. Tags are issued, heads counted, then everyone goes inside. Heads are counted again, where the main hallway veers off into bedrooms. One afternoon, after the children had come inside from playing and they had all been accounted for, I was sitting in a caretaker's lounge with a cup of coffee, just finally catching my breath. It was completely silent, and I thought I had heard through the wall a little voice say, let me in, three separate times. It was said so flat, and in the same way with each repetition, that I thought it was a child's doll or something. But after a while, the voice repeated a second time, saying, please let me in, three times. The phrasing changed each time I heard it, and it was probably the sixth time when I noticed that the only way it could be coming from the other side of the wall is if it was outside. Still skeptical, because all kids had been accounted for, but it was my duty to make sure. I unlocked the outside door, went out and scout around. The playground felt emptier than usual. For some reason, the entire world felt empty. I estimated the spot where the voice would have to be if I was going to hear it in the lounge. But naturally, there was nothing there. There wasn't even a toy. A shiver ran through me before I collected myself and headed back inside. I looked up just in time to see the outside door close and the latch shut. The door is on a spring so that it closes itself when anyone goes through it. So, somebody other than me had just gone through the door. I wasn't taking any chances. I got out my walkie and radioed to the other staff. We had set up a system in an emergency where staff runs to designated stations in the hallway at regular checkpoints so that if anyone wants to get any further in or out, they have to get through two staff members and they're always stationed at a point where there's no way around. So, when everyone took their positions, nobody had reported seeing anyone suspicious. Nobody reported seeing anyone at all. I couldn't get past that outside door and closing without me. But there was simply no rational explanation. I reluctantly let it go. The day ended. Everybody was tucked in and I personally made several rounds around the facility to make sure there was nobody lurking around. Everything was all clear. Only then, I could allow myself to stop holding my breath, sit down in my lounge, 
It wasn't really mine, but nobody else liked it, because it tended to get really cold around that time of year. I was working on getting paperwork done, but I ended up idly looking at clickbait on the internet. Still busy in the back of my head, trying to make sense of what had happened to the front door while I was outside. After a while, I heard the same voice from earlier. It spoke, just as mechanically, and it repeated another phrase three separate times. Only this time it was saying, let me out. I froze, not dare moving a muscle, not even daring to breathe. The request came a second time, slightly changed to please let me out, repeated three times. I didn't hesitate to radio out that time. Staff got up, took their positions, and a few came to join me in the lounge. I told them what I had heard, and we went to the front to investigate. There was nobody waiting for us in the front of the doors. One of the staff members absent-mindedly unlocked the front door to take a look around outside. Something, I don't know what, came running up the hallway towards us. It was moving unnaturally fast, and it stood at least as tall as I did. I'm rather tall, as far as women go. What got to me the most were the two dimly lit glowing red eyes that I could see in the head shape. The second thing I noticed was the short antlers that seemed to be sprouting from its skull. These observations were made in less than two seconds, because in that very space of time, it had sprinted out the front door. I seemed to be the only one that noticed the thing make its escape. I must have looked like a madwoman when I shouted about not letting the thing outside, and then yelling about chasing it and not letting it get away. The staff members assisting me looked at me like I was crazy. We did a head count on all the sleeping children. Three of them were missing. That ended up being the longest, most frustrating, most fruitless undertaking I had ever experienced in that foster home. All anyone knew about those three kids was that they were in their beds the last time anybody saw them. There was no sign of them ever leaving their beds or their rooms. No sign of anybody ever coming into the rooms. Nothing. No signs of a struggle. No hidden bones or buried bodies. Nothing. They were simply gone. And there was my testimony about a supernatural thing that only I ever saw and heard. Because of that, they were starting to cast a very critical eye on me. This eventually led to me resigning. In the end, they couldn't pin anything on me, which was really saying something because the system is really good at making a villain out of an innocent bystander with circumstantial evidence when they want to badly enough. There wasn't any evidence to work with. So, here I am. These days, I work a job that I'm pretty underqualified for. Despite not having any charges leveled against me, nobody will accept me at any foster homes or any caretaking facilities. The stink of that bad situation just seems to follow me wherever I go. My faith in the system is completely shaken. Any system that fails to protect children and then punishes the people that protect them faithfully is long overdue for a change. If anyone out there has experienced something remotely similar, just know that you are not alone. I'd even be willing to talk if you wanted to reach out to me, and we might be able to help each other. Thank you so much, What Lurks Beneath, for being a channel for me to, and others like me, to get our experiences out there in the open to other like-minded individuals who are willing to listen and understand. One of the tourist traps here in Southern California was a hunter who sold animal pelts that he had hunted and prepared himself. Nobody seemed to be questioning the legality of what exactly he was doing. So, 
I didn't have anything against getting a genuine coyote pelt. A big part of the sale was the authenticity of the man himself. If there was ever a person that could tell you was full-blooded Indian just by looking at him, it was him. The only difference being that with most Native Americans that I've met, they seem to have a serene wisdom in their eyes. This man didn't have that. There was something harsh and hard-edged in his gaze, but I figured that just came with hunting in the deserts of Southern California. At the time, coyotes were marked as being an overpopulation issue, so not surprisingly, most of what we had for sale were derived from coyotes. I bought one pelt that had been fashioned into a carrying pouch that I could wear on my waist, and since cooler weather was around the corner, I bought a skin hat. I went my way, and that was the last I ever expected to see of the guy. His goodbye smile went all the way up to his one good eye. The other one, that was whited out with a cataracts, registered no emotion. I got on the highway for the long journey back to South Dakota. It was only a matter of time before I would have to pull over to sleep, but I tried to make that moment as far away as possible. I don't know what made me look out of the corner of my eye, but when I did, I saw what appeared to be some sort of dog-like creature running on all fours and doing a great job of keeping pace with my vehicle. I was driving the legal limit on the highway. Its overall bearing suggested that it was a coyote, but the legs were incredibly long, unnaturally long. It almost looked like somebody had taken the legs from a deer and glued them onto a wild dog. I checked my mirrors. I was the only person on the highway. It was a full moon, so there was plenty of light and I could see that my eyes weren't playing tricks on me. I tried to get my phone out to take a picture, but I felt myself seize up when the creature looked right at me. It had one coppery eye that was perfectly clear, and then it had one that was whited out. It bared its teeth at me in a snarl, but I knew deep down that it was a grin, and just like a leaf in a hurricane, it was gone. Is it possible, now I know this sounds crazy, but is it possible that the man that I bought the pelt from has the power to shapeshift or could have been a skinwalker? I know it might sound far-fetched, but I can't help draw an eerie correlation between the two. What is your opinion? I work as a ranger. And as you can imagine, we happen upon some very strange things from time to time. All sorts of things that I could tell you about. Things that members of the public would never believe. Things that I would have never believed without having seen them firsthand for my very self. One of those things is when we found a whole load of dead animals with no obvious injuries whatsoever. Upon closer inspection, we happen to come across two tiny puncture wounds on their bodies, but in random places. Sometimes the neck, but often the leg, stomach, anywhere really. And cause of death was always full and total loss of blood. The bodies were dry husks. We're not just talking small creatures either. We found deer doe and bucks, moose, even black bear. We didn't have a clue what on earth could possibly be responsible. One of my colleagues threw the idea of a vampire, but he was rightfully laughed at. We didn't have a clue what on earth could possibly be responsible, so we ended up having a stakeout, trying to capture what was causing all of this devastation. We set up nighttime cameras, and a few of us made the decision to stay out too. At this point, we were more interested than frightened, and also, we wanted to know what was doing this. Around midnight, we heard a noise. We were all hunkered down, just waiting to see what, if anything, might come. 
And of course, the woods in the evening isn't exactly quiet. So, we were just waiting to see what was causing the attacks. We were looking at the monitor, which was showing us the screen from the infrared cameras. We didn't want to get too close to where we thought the action was taking place, as whatever predator it was would be able to smell us and likely not appear. Well, something did show up on camera, but we have no idea what it was. It was large, a strong and sturdy mass by the look of it, appeared to have dark skin or fur, and was able to overpower the deer without any problems. We hadn't set any sort of elaborate trap, as to be honest. We weren't even sure if it was going to show, and if it did, where it would be. But we did have guns and a flare which we now shot up into the sky as a warning. It didn't react at all to the flare, so we shot off a couple more rounds. More to scare it off than anything. This it didn't seem to like, and it raced off. There were three of us watching this. Two of us were veterans at this game, but we had a rookie with us too. The other and I were more than happy to observe. We didn't want to go chasing after this thing when we probably weren't prepared to protect ourselves. Whatever that creature was, it was easily able to overpower and drain large animals of their blood. If it could take down an adult moose, why not a person? However, the rookie must have gotten it into his head that he wanted to be some kind of hero as he charged off in the direction of the beast. Thankfully, whatever it was was now long gone. Even with a firearm, I wouldn't have hedged any bets on who would win. And do you know what? It never came again. Whether it knew it had been spotted or not, or whether it sensed us there, we'll never know. But we never had another unexplained death. No more random puncture wounds, and certainly no more draining of blood. It'll be a mystery that we will never solve. My parents were high school sweethearts, living in Arizona at the time. Sometimes, they would go horseback riding together, far out into the desert. They ended up buying a ranch too. But before all of that, they had a really messed up and traumatic experience. Just after they had gotten married, they decided to head out into the desert for a couple of days and camp out overnight. They each rode a horse and took a tent and supplies. They were used to this kind of thing and knew how to be safe, what to look out for, the best place to hitch up the horses, where there were shade and water, etc. At some point during the night, there was a tragedy, something which to this day, they still remember and cannot explain. You see, when they woke up the next morning, one of the horses was dead, flat on the ground, no visible injuries whatsoever, but very much so dead. The other horse was just standing next to it, as if it didn't even notice or care. It was very unusual, since horses are generally very sensitive creatures. Both my parents are very light sleepers. My mom often ends up on the couch when dad snores too loud. There was absolutely no way they would sleep through the noise of one of the horses being attacked. They were distraught, to say the least. It was my mother's horse and horse's neck. She noticed something. Two little holes, which were barely visible, but definitely there now that she had seen them. They were deep, not just surface wounds. Almost like something had drilled into the horse or latched onto it. There was the smallest drops of blood. My mother refused to leave her old friend, so my dad ended up riding his horse home, then driving his truck and trailer out to collect mother and hers. They asked one of their buddies, who was some sort of medical examiner, to see what could have caused the unusual wound and way of death. They were at this point, 
thinking that some sort of poisonous snake had bitten the horse and it somehow had a heart attack, even though there was none of the usual signs like vomiting or frothing around the mouth. Well, it wasn't that. When their buddy performed the autopsy, he ended up calling in another colleague, as he was totally stumped by what he had discovered. He asked my parents, Are you sure there wasn't any blood at the scene? And they replied, Nothing. Not a drop. It would have been easy to spot, because you see, when the guy opened up the horse, it was completely dry inside. Not one single drop of blood was left, as if it had all been leaked out. When examining the wound on the neck, they discovered it was a clean puncture wound. Very well done. The only possible explanation of death was that something had latched onto the horse. Somehow, without making a single noise or kicking up a fuss, and completely drained it of every last drop of blood. All the while, the second horse just watched, not being spooked or fussing. All done in total silence. Otherwise, one of my parents would have actually awoken. This story made the local newspaper. People began locking their animals up at night, keeping a closer eye on them. A couple even set up guard on their barns, armed with shotguns. Meanwhile, others began hanging crosses in their yards, or even burning sage. Rumors were rife, and one name kept coming up over and over, although my parents swore they never took much notice. Chupacabra. Was it really the blood-sucking mythical beast? From what I have read, it usually prefers goats, but hey, how do we know whether even cryptids can pass on a free meal? when they just so happen to be passing through. I'm not saying I believe one way or the other, really, but it was the right area and right sort of time. What else could have caused that sort of injury and cause of death and leave absolutely zero trace? I had a really weird and pretty scary experience the other night. I was out, walking with my dog, and we were heading back from quite a long walk. I was feeling pretty worn out, and my dog was beginning to trail behind me. All I could think was putting my head down into my pillow. We live in quite a rural place, and there is a lot of space in between the houses. Several of my neighbors also have livestock, mainly chickens, a couple of pigs, that sort of thing. It was when I was walking past my closest neighbor, who just so happens to have three large pigs, that I heard a screaming, squealing noise. My dog began going mad, barking, trying to get off his leash. Mr. Jones in that house is old and deaf, and would likely sleep right through it, even if a coyote or something was attacking his precious pigs. He loved those pigs more than any person. Grabbing the leash tighter, I headed into the yard, thought I would be a good neighbor and go check on his pigs. I knew he wouldn't mind me being on his property, or so I hoped. I was just trying to be a good Samaritan. But I didn't want to spook the pigs anymore, so I tied the dog to a post and headed carefully over to the pen. Now, to be honest, I'm not sure exactly what I was expecting to see. It was pretty dark, of course, as it was around one in the morning. Listen, I work swing shifts, so my schedule is literally all over the place. So I try and get exercise and walks in when I can. But Mr. Jones keeps a porch light on, which was giving just enough illumination to the pen that I could roughly make out what was happening. Something was in there with them. I'm not a fool. I'd be out walking my dog, and I didn't have any sort of weapon on me. I backed away real slow, took the dog off his leash. I no longer cared about spooking the pigs. Here is a big dog, and my hope was that he would scare off whatever was in there. I didn't know exactly what it was. 
It looked kind of like the size and shape of a coyote, but it didn't look right. I told myself it was just fright. I was scared, and the fact that the pig pen was in shadows. Well, my dog leapt in and began attacking whatever this animal was. About a minute later, gave a yelp that almost stopped my heart in place. The thing, which was certainly not a coyote, jumped over the fence of the pen and raced off towards the woods at the back of his property, on two legs. I didn't get a great look at it. I jumped into the pen as my dog was lying on his side, whimpering and dying. There was blood pouring out of his neck. I checked on the pigs. All three were dead. They looked like they had just fallen over and died. I wrapped my dog's neck in my sweater and banged on Mr. Jones's door. I didn't want to stay. I wanted to get home and make sure my dog was okay, but I had to tell him what had happened. The next morning, I went back to see him, and thankfully, the injury to my dog had been superficial, and after a quick trip to the ER animal doctor, he was patched up. The vet was a bit baffled as to that animal, since I told them about the attack. What could have caused the injury, as he said it was a very specific wound? Two puncture marks. Mr. Jones, however, was devastated. The sheriff was called, and it was reported. When the sheriff came to see him and take a look at the pigs, he was just as baffled as the vet had been. They ended up asking the same animal doctor that I told you it was a small rural town about the cause of the death. The only injury he could find was two puncture marks on each of their necks. Cause of death, blood loss, not a drop of blood left in anything. What did I see that night? Was this a person puncturing the neck holes? Was this some sort of wild dog that had the ability to walk upright? But what on earth sucks the blood out of animals like this? Is it true that vampires can be a thing? Or are there vampiric animals? Please, help me understand this. I am just trying to make sense of it all and I honestly can't. So, I have to preface this story with admitting that I had been drinking when it happened. However, we are talking a few beers, down with my local friends. I wasn't wasted. Just a nice warm buzz. Best to be honest. It happened a few years ago. Now. Oh, and before I continue, I have never met any drinker in my entire life or known anybody that has seen things off of a few beers. I feel like that's important to note. When I tell this story, and people say, yeah, but you drank, or yeah, but you were buzzed. Again, alcohol, at least in that small of quantity, does not cause hallucinations. Not like this. As I said, I'd been down at the bar, and we had been chit-chatting and having a good time. Once it got to closing time, we all headed off our own way. For me, it was about a half hour walk home from me, which I never minded. The fresh air was always clearing and invigorating. I have walked that route a hundred times, day and night. And at the time, it was sometime in November, before Thanksgiving. I can recall it being very dark and cold, and I was walking pretty quickly. I do live in a little busy town, though, so there were streetlights most of the way, cars going past. It wasn't dead, even though it was roughly 11.30 p.m. So not early, but not in the early hours in the morning. But halfway through my walk, there is also an underpass under one of the main roads. They're never pleasant places. You don't want to hang around them. Not because I thought anything bad might happen, but they stink. Lots of trash. There might be a homeless camp nearby, I'm not sure. But I do know sometimes you get homeless people. They never give me any problems, and I feel bad for them. 
but they usually bring down a lot of bad things. Drugs, trash, drug deals, gangs, etc. It's a case of head down, hands in pockets, breathe through your mouth and get out of there as soon as possible. The road above it is fairly large and the pass is quite long and of course several of the lights in there are always broken or seem to be flickering. Even in the middle of the day, it can be a bit spooky. So, it was typical that when I was walking through right, then less than half of the lights seemed to be on one, and the ones that were, were flicking on and off, like some lame laser show. I was less than halfway in, when they all went out together, just for a moment or two. I stopped still, as they began to flicker again towards the other end of the pass, the end I needed to get to in order to exit. And standing there was the single most terrifying thing I've ever laid my eyes on. At first, I thought it was a person, because what else would be standing there, tall and upright, on two legs? A person, right? What I'm about to tell you now is going to sound very cliché, but the tunnels seem to get really cold. Yes, I have already said it was November, and nighttime, but the air went from chilly to absolute frigid. I could just sense that gut feeling, that instinctual, that something was really off about this person. But I had no choice. I had to keep moving, and the only way I was going to get home was to pass him or them. As I got closer, the more weird I felt. My entire being was screaming run away. And to be honest, as I said, although I was no means drunk, I think the alcohol in my system kept me moving and not running back in fear. They don't call it Dutch courage for nothing. Just as I was close enough to be able to make out this blurry and shadowy feature, the end light above him flashed on and I got to see exactly what was in the underpass with me. He did look like a person. So far, he was human-shaped. I know that sounds weird, but let me explain. The first thing I noticed was that he was naked and had almost white, pale, translucent-like skin. Hairless, very skinny, almost sickly. Think like a Holocaust survivor on the verge of death, bones protruding out from under their skin. They looked visibly starved, as if seeing a pale naked bloke in the tunnel in the middle of the night wasn't traumatic enough. Then what I will describe now will tell you why this was so bad. His face wasn't right. He, or they, or whatever it was had tiny little black eyes, virtually no nose, and a wide gaping mouth that appeared to have sharp little teeth like a shark, and two overly sized protruding canines. That's right, canines, as in fangs. And his face was dried blood all over it, like there was some coming out of his mouth. And I could tell you, I stood there, gaping at him. I can tell you, I just stood there, gawking at him or it. I'm not sure now I could call this thing a him. I just don't know. Then, just as I actually began murmuring some sort of prayer, I thought it was going to kill me. But it sort of just flew away. I know it sounds weird, but honestly, just like in a movie or something, it shot straight up into the air and appeared to dissipate or vanish entirely. I ran out of there as fast as I could, all the way home, like my life depended on it, and it really did feel that way. What was that thing? I keep going through all sorts of ideas. I know some drugs can really mess you up, but as far as I know, they don't give you the ability to fly. As I said, it was a few years ago now. I can tell you that I never went near that underpass again. If I met my friends, I'd just get a taxi or an Uber home, not even bother walking, not even in the daylight, unless I couldn't help it. I've looked through newspapers, online articles, 
anything, but I've never come across anyone seeing remotely similar to this. Or maybe they have, and like me, have just been too scared to talk about it, through fear of ridicule, or fear of being called a liar. Either way, I know that I will never forget that night, and that thing I saw, I hope I never see it again. I wouldn't call myself an urban explorer. I would just call myself somebody whose curiosity gets the better of him when he sees places that look like they've been abandoned for a very long time. I don't take all the pictures, I don't make the videos, and I don't run the YouTube channel. I just see a dark hole, and some part of me decides that I can't go on with life unless I see what's in there. It amazes me how people go through their daily lives and don't notice the empty, dark places that surround them. It's like they just take it for granted that there's no empty and used space around them, when actually, such places are close enough that at any given time for them to breathe on. I take the subway to work every day. Just about everybody around me has their nose buried in a book or glued to their phones. But I have a way of looking around because there's bound to be a part of the subway that's no longer in use and that's waiting to be explored. There was one such place that I've been working up the courage for months to check out. I noticed it within two or three weeks of taking this new job, which required that I take the subway. You would miss it if you blinked. I couldn't tell if it was a hole in the wall or a door in the wall that just wasn't maintained. Either way, it was in a section of the tunnel that was supposed to have been off limits to pedestrians, which for me was a big flashing red arrow. I eventually decided on a day that I was going to check it out. I packed a bag, and made sure I had a couple of functioning lights, and got the schedule of the train down so that I wouldn't get squished, and then I went. The walk to the hole in the wall was a bit longer than I had estimated. I likely misjudged how quickly I was traveling when I was in the subway car. The adrenaline rush from wondering if I was going to make it in time without getting run over was oddly enjoyable, but looking back, it's not something I would want to do again. I'm happy to say that I reached my destination without incident. The only thing that happened was my heartbeat picking up from sheer excitement. There was indeed a door, but it looked like it had been torn off its hinges at one point in time, and half-heartedly put back in place. I didn't need a fraction of the tools that I thought I would. The door put up as much as a fight as a dead body. Shining my torch around, the first room I found myself in appeared to be some sort of office space. Desks and swivel chairs were glazed with dust. Nothing smelled out of the ordinary, besides the mustiness and stillness of age. The furniture, having a slightly dated look to it, so, I made a mental note to keep an eye out for a calendar that maybe had been left behind. I was hooked. The place was mine, and I was going to uncover its secrets. The other rooms were similar. There didn't appear to be any accommodations for visitors. No lounges or anything where people would sit around reading magazines. I uncovered at least 11 rooms and I was beginning to wonder if I would get lost. But what I had found was turning out to be rather vast. Even with all these rooms, there was no papers left behind, no calendars, which was as inspiring as it was disheartening. It suggested to me that they were trying to hide something sensitive. And then, I went into one of the more rooms that was behind a heavy door, heavy enough to take care of a freezer. That's when the smell had hit me. Something had been rotting down there, and recently. Perhaps a rat or something. I tried to tell myself, but shining my light around revealed carcasses of wild animals, arranged in neat stacks, 
foxes, squirrels, raccoons, feral dogs, cats, and even rats. I think I even saw something big enough to be a dog or a coyote. Some detail about the bodies was trying to reach me through my senses. I had to stare before I could finally put my finger on it. Each carcass had two neatly spaced punctures in it. Also, the carcasses that had clearly been there a while seemed to be well preserved, as if they had somehow been embalmed, which would mean that the blood had been drained out of them. That's when I felt my throat tighten. My senses ramped up, and my imagination threatened to conjure up perceptions where there was nothing to see or hear. I began to think that I could hear something matching my footsteps. There hadn't been an echo before, and then there was when I had discovered the stash of partially mummified animals. When I direct my light to where I thought I could hear the mimic, there was nothing. I decided to walk out there and not look back or stop for anything. And that's when something behind me lunged and missed. When I got my light on it, I thought I was looking at a very scrawny, naked child. It was thin as bodies you saw in the photos of mass burials during World War II. Then, it turned its head toward me. It had a canine cast to its features, yet it appeared to be pink and bald. Its mouth hung open, showing two rather long canine teeth, a very long tongue, and an organ clearly in the habit of lapping. I realized that I had brought nothing with me to properly defend myself, so I tried to keep my light on it and back out of the abandoned cluster of rooms. The face it kept trained on me looked fearful, but it advanced on me with each step I took backwards. I wasn't afraid of me at all. It made soft hisses, followed by muffled clicks in its throat. Just as I had thought I might have cornered myself by not looking where I was going, I found the aperture back out into the subway. Checking the time was an afterthought. My only concern was getting away from the subway. It came right up to the doorway, but it seemed to flinch at the light. I made it back out without getting run over or bitten. That's probably one of the most horrific urban exploration stories I can share with you. I've been single since I was 16. I'm 37. I can't go around sharing my story with the public because it technically involves an unsolved case. In this day and age, any publicity can be turned around and made somehow into incriminating evidence. It's just something that I've been carrying around for a long time, and I need to tell somebody. Even if nobody knows who I am, I'm hoping that telling it to you guys and your listeners, by extension, will help me to lay this to rest. I fell in love when I was 15. I think everybody knows just how white-hot teenage love burns. It may be shallow, but it's still intense. We both lived in a backwater township in Michigan. One of those places where you have a huge forest and six houses, just close enough to each other, that somebody eventually decides that constitutes a town. We had been neighbors there all of our lives, and didn't even know it until middle school. We both couldn't look away when we first saw each other. Both of us spent our share of time outdoors, so it was only a matter of time, of course, that we would find ways of spending time together outside the classroom, without anyone suspecting it. Despite growing up all around those woods, there were certain parts of it that made me feel apprehensive. But this girl, she was fearless. She drove straight into thorns and poison ivy, and stuff that looked like coyote slept in it, and she never got hurt or anything. I tried to charm her as a good old country boy, then came to find out she was more rugged and at home in the outdoors than I was. It was as endearing as it was embarrassing. I told her 
that we needed a spot where nobody would ever interrupt us when we were together. So, she took my hand and guided me to a corner of the woods that made the outside world feel a million miles away. Almost a whole other world away. But it was near enough to have the rickety remains of one of those old-timey corn cribs. She had outfitted it just enough for us to be comfortable. It looked like a condemned structure from the outside, but cozy enough in. We had an oil lantern in case we got caught in the dark. Like all teenage relationships, there were rough spots. Some worse than others, but we got through most of them, all but one. And it was the one that cost me the most. I only had the backbone to go out to our special spot when she was with me. I just couldn't do it by myself. I felt like there were things in the thickets and the shadows, just waiting to get me by myself. She was in and out of there, all the time by herself. But I just didn't have it in me. Our parents were beginning to get suspicious. And to that, the fact that she thought I had my eye on someone else. She wouldn't let me explain my side of things in detail that I thought was necessary. So, we ended up arguing really bad and went our separate ways. She was not at school the next day, or the day after. The weekend came, and I spied on her house. I saw her parents, and I saw her little brother, but I did not see her. I wondered if she was camping out at our special spot. I'm ashamed to say that I was too much of a coward to make a walk out to it by myself. I wanted to, but no matter how I put my mind to it, I couldn't shake the feeling of some kind of presence in those woods, watching me the way I watched her house. I let Saturday and Sunday go with her, still missing. Of course, by then, the alarm had been sounded that there was a teenager who was unaccounted for. It wasn't safe for me to spy on her house anymore, and the whole thing hit the news. By Tuesday, I had worked up the bravery to go out to our special spot and see if anything had become of her there. She was there, and she was dead. I had hoped that she was just asleep, but nobody sleeps with their eyes open by that much. There was a notepad nearby. She had been writing me a letter when something interrupted her. It was a letter to me, and the page was only half full, and it ended in the middle of a sentence. There were no bruises, only two holes cleanly punched into her neck. Her skin was even gray and devoid of color. I got home, called the cops, told them what I had found. That was the day that my faith in humanity came to a screeching halt. I never dreamed that so many people would want me to be the bad guy. Not just her parents, but the rest of the town. The rest of the viewing area. Minds were made up that I was the one that had killed her. I must have done it in a fit of jealousy when I saw the note she was writing. When I made my defense with the strange injuries found on her neck, people acted like I was speaking in Latin or something. It just didn't register. Their anger made them deaf to anything that wasn't a confession of guilt. Just enough detectives and legal eagles had just enough brain cells to comprehend the fact that I wasn't responsible for her death, and I was ruled out as the killer. But the judge's verdict wasn't good enough for everyone else. I was all but completely ostracized. I'm pretty much a hermit now. I have been ever since that I could afford to live on my own. People are like unpredictable dogs. Yes, I've gone back to our special spot. I've done so, so many times over the years. A few times, I did it to offer myself to whatever had killed her, or whoever, to leave behind my body to the community. Then... I started getting the idea that I would kill the thing that killed her and present it to either law enforcement or possibly the Smithsonian's, depending on what I find. 
I've come close to bagging it a few times, and it's definitely not human. I don't think it has the mental capacity to understand what it has done to my life and my psychiatric health. That doesn't change the fact that I'm going to kill it. That's my reason for living right now. Killing this thing. When I'm not drinking long enough to get myself together and go out there, I try to figure more about the thing. I'll get my way eventually. After that, I don't know what I'll live for. This was before you weren't allowed to smoke in bars anymore. I was at my favorite beer hole, where the smoke was thick enough to drive a nail into it. I was just beginning to get a real good buzz when my younger brother started blowing at my phone. His speech was so rushed that I was afraid that he had gotten back on the meth again. Turned out he was just super excited over something. All I could piece together was that I needed to come to his place as soon as possible. I was caught. I didn't dare tell him that I went out drinking without him. I couldn't dream of anything more important to keep me from going, so I paid up my tab and left. The trees and the telephone lines were black cutouts against the setting sun by the time I pulled into his driveway, and he was waiting outside for me, running in circles like a dog that needed to go real bad. I asked him what was so important that I had to drop everything and come running right that second. He gestured to me to follow him and didn't even stop to make sure I was following. He picked up an electric lantern and led me out to a small barn where he housed a hobby-sized crowd of goats. The goats were laying down, looking at us. I couldn't help but notice that they were looking nervous. My brother took me over to a couple of crates where a goat lay drawn out. I could hear the buzzing of a few flies, and I caught the whiff of death. My brother looked at me, as he was expecting some sort of reaction. Dead animals did not impress me, and I was starting to get creeped out by the eagerness that I saw in my brother's eyes. I asked him what this was all about. He told me to take a close look. I objected, on account of the fact that it was dead and had been so long enough to clearly stink. He pointed to the animal's neck, held the lantern close in the goat's dark fur. I could see it. Two holes evenly spaced, like something done by a large snake. I looked at my brother, who still looked like a maniac, about to peel out of a bank robbery. I asked him if he had found a giant anaconda or something. He shook his head, and he brought me over to another set of crates with a cage on top of it. My eyes still weren't completely adjusted, and I thought I had seen some kind of monkey behind those bars. But this monkey had no fur, had pale pink skin that was the same texture of the pleather on my steering wheel, and the eyes were wide open, coppery orange colored, and two long hook-like canine teeth sticking out from the creature's lips. And then, I saw those teeth, and it hit me. I waited for some hint that this entire thing was fake. But no. It blinked. It twitched. The skin around its shoulders and legs writhed as it was seized, with the instinct to flee, but could not. He must have been happy with the look that came onto my face. He tried to tell me it was something funny-sounding, like a choopy kooby or something. I'm not sure. He said that he had lost several goats to it and wasn't sure what to make of it until that point. So he put a hen in a cage and waited, and just like that, he bagged it. He proceeded to dance around like a fool, and that was something he did only when he was under the influence. I wouldn't find out much later that he indeed had been getting back on the meth, and beginning to abuse other stuff. He figured that with the money he was going to make from selling this thing to the proper people, he could afford that lifestyle. Well, when you dance around like that in close proximity, you tend to knock it over. 
and cages that get knocked over have a good chance of opening. And to open cages tend to not hold whatever was inside of them, if you catch where I'm going. My brother knocked over the cage, and I saw the whole thing play out like it was in slow motion. The thing seemed surprised that it had a chance to get away, but I wasn't going to put my hands on it, and my brother's coordination was shot. It got away, just like that. My brother screwed up and paid for it. Nothing dramatic. Since he tested positive for all the garbage in the system, nobody believed a word of what he had to say, and I didn't see anything like that little green gremlin sense. You're the only person that will ever hear me admit that, which is weird. And this is a story I've been keeping in, and I know by the way I write it that I probably sound like a storyteller, but this was my own personal experience. I've never in my life seen a creature that looked to be like that. It reminded me of some failed science experiment, something you'd hear about in a sci-fi movie, where they genetically splice things together to create a whole new being. Well, now that's a thing of the past, I hope. I would like to tell you about the single most terrifying thing that I have ever experienced as a rookie cop. In fact, this messed me up so much that I left the force soon after. I just couldn't cope afterwards. I won't give any specifics such as where this happened, or an exact date. Even though I'm no longer in the job, there could still be repercussions somehow. God knows the nightmare shall be punishment enough. It started off as a regular call from dispatch. Neighbor had called in, saying that she had heard a commotion in the yard next door and the sound of smashing glass. It was roughly two in the morning and had been loud enough to wake her up. She hadn't seen anything, but thought that she had heard a dog barking, which she'd also found weird, since the neighbor she was reporting about did not have a pet. We were treating it as a possible break-in, since the neighbor said the woman lived alone, so a domestic disturbance was likely. As usual, we were short on officers available for backup, with there already having been a shooting that evening that had been taken out most of the ship as they dealt with multiple perpetrators and witnesses. So it was just me and my partner, these kind of calls weren't unusual, but since I was still kind of new, they always kept the adrenaline pumping. I'd only been in the job a couple of years, and I'd already seen two colleagues buried. We turned off the lights and sirens as we approached the property. My partner, whom we'll call him Joe, went to the front door. I headed to the back. Thankfully, there was a porch light on, so the yard was lit well. The neighbor who had called it in had mentioned hearing a commotion. There was trash everywhere. It appeared like whoever had broken in had first emptied out all the garbage cans and spread them all over the floor. Mindless destruction. Or had they been looking for something? It was hard to tell. There was indeed a smashed window there. Usually, if somebody smashes a window... It's in order to reach through to an open door. I mean, anyone who watches a movie knows that. But this was a full window taken out, and it looked like whoever had gone through it had done so in a hurry, as there was blood on the remaining glass and what looked to be fur. I remember Dispatch had mentioned a possible dog at the scene, but not belonging to the owner of the property. It seemed weird. Perps don't usually bring Shep for walkies when casing a joint. Anyway, I push the door and it opens. I radio to Joe that I'm going in and will open the front door for him. As I check the kitchen where the broken window is, there is now a trail of blood going all the way through the house. My gun is out and I'm checking each room as I go through. 
but nothing. I let Joe in, and we head up the stairs, seeing more blood as we go too. Now, it would be exactly a surprise if I said that I had a really bad feeling about this. Not that any call that involves trails of blood ends well, but there was an extra feeling that something was very, very wrong. I will admit, I was scared. The closer we got to the bedroom, the more intense this feeling grew, and I would even go so far as to saying that I could sense evil in that house. Now, maybe that in hindsight, me looking back and adding memories of feelings, I can't say for sure, but I can tell you that what we found when we opened the bedroom door was the absolute epitome of evil. But just before we opened the door, we stood quietly outside it and listened, just for a second or two, to see if we could glean any extra information about where the perp might be in the room. We could hear what sounded like two people in there. Two distinct sets of noises. One, we assumed was the female of the property, and it sounded like the poor woman was whimpering. But she was still able to make a noise and therefore be alive, which was a good sign. The second noise was more unusual, as it sounded like a heavy pant and a low growl. Now, we knew there had been a report of a dog being heard, but why couldn't we hear the second person? We busted to the door, guns out and ready, but I don't think we could have ever actually been ready for what we saw. I know for sure that I will never forget it. There was a lot of blood to start with, and we weren't sure who it all belonged to. The woman was lying on the bed. The covers had been thrown off. They were piled in a heap on the floor. She was wearing a nightie, which had been pushed up, exposing her legs and panties. They were covered in blood. There was a large wound on one of her legs, near to her ankle, and it looked, God help her, like a bite mark. The sight of the blood wasn't the most shocking thing about her. It was the look of terror upon her face. And then we saw why. I had rushed to the woman while Joe had remained by the door. And now the perp appeared from behind it. I will just straight out tell you exactly what it was. A dog man. Let me describe this thing for you. I won't ever forget what he looked like since I see him every night in my dreams. I would guess around 6'5", very well built, strong as an ox, as my Nona would have said. Despite being covered in a dark brown, rough-looking hair, you could see its muscles rippling through, like it went to the gym. You think the rock, but with fur. He wore no clothing, but the hair was all over, even on his face. He was bipedal, stood tall and proud, not like a dog who was begging, but like he was meant to be on his two legs. His arms and legs were in proportion to his torso, although the arms seemed to hang a little lower than a human's would. At the end of the powerful-looking legs were large feet, each with a large curled claw, kind of like a talon, and at the end of each long arm was a huge paw again, with razor-sharp-looking claws. That all led up to the head. If the body of this abomination was meant to resemble man by its shape, the head was 100% dog. I could have been looking into the face of one of our canine units. It was German Shepherd for sure, which may be some wolf thrown in. The small pointy ears were pressed down, the long black snout dripping, Small black eyes stared right at me, and the mouth was open. Curled lips and a snarl to show a very dangerous set of teeth. There was now fresh blood all around the maw, and that was when I also noticed more blood matting the hair on one side of its body. That must have been the blood trail that we had followed from the broken window. Now, I don't know about you, but when I watch a horror movie, and the hero doesn't bat any eye when they see the vampire, or creature, or werewolf, or monster. Just instinctively, somehow, knows what to do to kill them. I always thought to myself, if I met a monster in real life, 
I'd probably soil myself and run away, or be completely frozen in fear. It's one thing to go onto autopilot and use your training when you're faced with a human, but there are no lessons at the academy about what to do when you meet a non-human foe. Suddenly, it leapt at me, and then I heard a bang. There was a flash, a howl, and a crash. Joe had managed to do one better than me, and had come out of his shocked stupor when the thing made to attack me and shot it. It had hit the beast, and then smashed through the upstairs window into the garden below. In the few seconds it took to look out, it was gone. There was a load more blood and hair in the rose bush below the window, where it had landed, but it was now gone. Training kicked in, and then, we dealt with the victim, stemming the blood flow on her leg until the EMTs arrived. The poor woman was absolutely traumatized, as you would expect. Thankfully, it had only been a physical attack, and I say only, knowing full well just how traumatic the entire thing was. Believe me, if it had gone from sniffing to worse. Anyway, she was patched up and allowed to go home. By then, I had already had the talk with the brass, told to change the statements, and told the party line was to be a human, messed up on PCP, had broken in looking for cash. There was no such dogman. It wasn't long after that I left. And do you know the absolute worst thing about the entire story? People know about this, and it's being covered up. These creatures, these predators are real, and nobody, for whatever reason, is allowed to talk about it. I am a hunter. I've been hunting for years. I would consider myself experienced, but considerate. I keep to the seasons, abide by the rules and laws, and always safety first. I enjoy the thrill of the kill, but I also hunt for food. If I shot a deer, I bring it home and feed the entire family. I'm telling you all this to let you know that I'm not some sort of gun-toting crazy that goes out killing for the sake of it. I've also been doing it for a long time. I'm well into my 50s now and began going out with my father when I was just a young teen. Again, this is just to let you know that I have seen many things, as you can imagine, out in the woods. That, when I came across the animal I'm about to tell you about, I was confused, and I wasn't mistaken. It was turkey season, so I was out early, hoping to catch a big tom. I was looking to find somewhere to bunker down, it was around 5 in the morning or so, a touch of mist, and still quite dark. There was a profound dampness in the air. Since I'd been in the woods many times, I knew the exact place I wanted to make a sort of base. I headed over to the spot that I'd used many times as it had awesome coverage, with the trees, and a sort of dip in the ground, which seemed to almost be ready to be lying and waiting in. But, as I headed over, I was certain that I was in the right spot. Something felt off. Call it a gut feeling. Some sort of hunter's intuition, if you will. I can read a situation which has come in mighty handy many times before, and kept me out of a couple of tight scrapes. And that's what I felt now. That something wasn't right. As I said, it was still pretty dark since it was early dawn, and I was more feeling my way from memory than actually being guided by any sort of light. I don't take a flash or nothing with me, so I hadn't seen what had decided to make me usual spot in my home, until I came closer than I would have if I had known. Thankfully, I heard before I saw, and what I heard made all the hairs on the back of my neck stand straight up. Dogs. I could tell it was dogs from the low growl, whining and yapping, and those sounds were the most alarming, as they seemed to be coming from a pub. Now, anyone knows that the worst kind of animal to encounter is a mama. They will do anything to protect their offspring, and quite rightly so. 
I wasn't sure why there would be a pack of feral dogs in the woods. I had never seen anything like them in there before, but I did not want to hang about. I was just about to try and sneak off when my cell phone began to vibrate. To say I was angry was an understatement. I always turn it off entirely before a hunt. Still, at least, it wasn't blurring out ACDC. Maybe the vibration alone wouldn't attract any unwanted attention. But of course it did. Again, I heard it before I saw it. That growling noise. Only, there seemed to be something very, very wrong. I stood up. I'm over six feet tall. That sound should have been coming from at the very most around the top of my leg area. Yet it seemed like it was coming from right beside me. And in fact, I could swear that I could feel hot breath on the back of my neck. My first instinct was to run. But I also know that sometimes running away makes whatever is behind you give chase. I needed to turn to face this thing and show some human dominance. Yeah, right. But that's what was going through my mind. That and total blind panic. As I slowly turned, I came face to face with what I assume was the mama dog. Only she wasn't dog-sized. She was not wolf-sized. She was people size. A huge she-dog, as big as me. Not like an actual hound on four legs that just happened to be massive. This thing was standing on two legs, looking me right in the eye. She was built like a pro wrestler, covered in a thick reddish-brown fur. Her head reminiscent of that of a Doberman, with those tight, mean-looking features. Her teeth were bared, and every tooth, unlike that of a regular dog, was pinpoint tack sharp. Before I could even turn away, I wanted to run. I was scared out of my mind. I didn't even bother to draw my weapon, head out at her, try anything to defend myself. I was that frightened, right then, that I honestly thought she was going to kill me, and I just wanted it to be quick and as pain-free as possible. Yes, my life flashed before my eyes right there and then. Then, there was another sound. A tiny yip, a yelping noise. It was the pup, and it seemed to be gravitating towards its mother. The tiny pup, who when I got a quick look, was actually the size of a small boy. Saved my life, as Mama seemed to think whatever the pup needed was more important than me, right at that moment. She quickly made her way back over to the nest. I ran. I was no longer worried about whether she would give chase. I just hedged my bets, and she was more protective than aggressive, and wanted me away from her offspring, rather than to eat me. Thank the Lord that bet paid off, and I'm alive to tell you this story. I haven't been back to that spot. I don't necessarily have faith that it was a death wish. But I also have never told anybody about it. I try to be a sensible hunter. I have plenty of friends who would kill anything and everything they come across. And they just like the killing part. And like to prove that they as men are on top of the food chain. The main predator on this planet. They'd be dumb to go out shooting lions and tigers. So if they knew about those creatures... I know that mama dog person was aggressive. I was sure. 100% sure that I had it. But she was being protective. You don't mess with moms. Those other hunters, though, they'd kill her and the baby. Wouldn't think nothing of it. Just carry the bodies out and parade them around to share all over the internet. I might have been more scared than I hope I'll ever be again, but I'm not cruel. The other thing is, if that was a baby and a mama, there must have been a dad. And if Mrs. Dogman was that big, what in the name is Mr. Daddy Dogman like? I was one of the Marines that had toured in Afghanistan the longest. It wasn't because I wanted to be there. It was because I was the one of the best in a firefight. 
I could keep my weapons hot and my head cool. When you're on the outside of the armed forces looking in, you see the medals you get when you survive through one disaster after another. When you're on the inside, you know that the real reward for surviving is going on missions with a slimmer chance of survival. Everyone else just dies faster. We were being dropped by a helicopter into an undisclosed location. I thought I had a pretty good grasp on the geography of the area, but looking down, I had no landmarks to properly guide me. It was wide open wilderness, like the underworld of some bad children's story. Our parameters were to gather whatever intel we could and neutralize any threats. That was by far the most vague and open-ended mission parameters that I've ever heard in my entire career. Who were the innocents? Were there any hostages? Were there any confirmed hostiles? Were we investigating to see if there were any hostiles? No such details were forthcoming. The last thing they told us was that we had an hour. And after that, they were leaving us there if we didn't come back out. That made me wonder if something had already been encountered at that location that nobody just came back from. But you didn't ask those questions out loud. We were kicked out in front of a caravan, set into a very spiky-looking mound of rock. It looked more and more like something from a bad story. I took point, and we turned on our light and plunged into the cave. It was remarkable how much cooler it was inside that cave than outside. It made me feel like I could breathe a little easier, but I still had to keep my wits about me. The first five minutes of crawling around in there had sold me on the idea that there were no people inhabiting the cave. The odd bone or two might have been left by some desert scavengers looking for shelter from the sun, but no people. I changed my mind in a hurry when we passed through a narrow opening into a room that was rank with the aroma of iron. The dark stains painted the walls all around and the ground. The horror show had officially begun. One thing led to another. Skulls with wooden stakes driven through them. Slabs of wood with rotting bodies stretched out and impaled with more wooden stakes and whatever else could be used in a similar fashion. We were so caught up with the cascade of grisly revelations that we lost our focus long enough for a hostile to leap out of some shadowy hiding place and let loose a volley of bullets. Most of the shots missed. Two found my armor and were safely buffeted. He wasn't wearing anything more protective than a cloth robe and my retaliatory shot found his head. He joined the rest of the head wounds littering the chamber. The surprise attack had shaken us, and we were eyes up from that moment on. The intensity of that first room was just the beginning. Mutilated bodies became a common part of the decor. There was one small chamber where the floor was completely eclipsed by human remains. What kind of information was the CO wanting? I don't even think he knew. The answer was probably in an office somewhere. I've seen enough Indiana Jones movies that I should have been able to avoid what happened next. I guess I just didn't expect to see anything like it outside the movies. We stepped into yet another chamber that had a high ceiling. This is the part where we got really nervous. There were sounds in that chamber. Animal noises that I could not place and I don't think my men could either. There were some that sounded like wild boars, others like lions. There was a lot that just did not match up with anything, and that's when I stepped forward and hit a tripwire. A heavy wooden gate slid down, sealing us in. It must have been on some kind of pulley system, because another gate opened as soon as that one came down. We trained our lights on the black opening, all the animal noises seemed to be coming from there. We were not prepared for the speed with which anything would burst out of the doorway. We were half a second too slow on the trigger when my bullets had struck the doorway. Someone was already on top of one of my men. 
the seconds that followed, with me retraining my aim and firing, began to slow down. I saw the shape that had tackled my fellow soldier. It wasn't human. It was superhuman. Huge. Muscular. Everything about it was taut with aggression. Its furry arms dealt one haymaker after another with blinding force and speed. I unloaded into the side of its ribs, shoulder and head. It landed on its back, stone dead, part of its hairy skull blown open. From the neck up, it looked like a very rugged German shepherd that had been in plenty of fights. From the neck down, it looked like a steroid-charged killing machine. All humanoid features, just very furry. I turned the light to my fallen soldier. His neck had been broken, and his face was peeled off. More grunts approached the opening of what was left, and we got ready. The gunfire created strobe lights in the cavern, and each flare was a snapshot of teeth and claws, and eyes that burned with a glow. There were at least four of them. I dropped two of them with volleys straight to the head. Shooting them in the chest didn't seem to do much, and a sickening cracking sound drew me over to see that one of them had breached a soldier's chest and was tearing into his ribcage. My light caught the movement of his lungs before clawed hands tore them out. It explained why I didn't hear him scream. The back of the monster soaked up nearly half of a magazine before it fell over. I shouted to whoever was left to get the exit unblocked. That maneuver cost us three more lives, as those three soldiers used themselves as shields to protect the marine that broke the supports, keeping the barrier in place. Three of us made it out. The people that orchestrated the operation wanted to know if we had completely taken care of all the hostiles. But we weren't sure. They marked it as a mission failure, and all of us were discharged. I was able to connect with someone out of pure chance who had been sent on a similar suicide mission to the exact same region. Just a different cavern. If you've ever experienced anything like this, please reach out to me. We need to talk. I saw my men torn apart, with nothing but claws and fingers, from beings that looked like the Egyptian Anubis. I want to know why they were fed to these things, like cans of tuna, and I'll be vetting you when you contact me, just to make sure. I think you'll understand. Thank you for taking the time to read this. I will be arrested for sure if I tell you who I am and where this took place. So I'm just going to tell you that I'm part of a cleanup crew hired to take care of the aftermath of one of the recent protests that turned violent on government property. No, I'm not referring to the Capitol building. That's not the first place that violence came to visit the suits and ties of American politics. It just hasn't been publicized as widely. The number of offices were trashed really good before police can turn the tide with their batons and tear gas. You don't realize just how much paper there is in government buildings until you have to clean it up. Desks were overturned. Filing cabinets were kicked over. Drawers were piled up and dumped out, looking like a war zone. This wasn't like past projects cleaning up government property. For whatever reason, they wanted all papers and all other forms of storage of information destroyed. If we did a thorough job, we got triple the pay. If we leaked anything we found, there was a chance we could face a lifetime of imprisonment. So, we approached the job with compliant attitudes. It did confuse me as to why you'd keep such sensitive info in a place where the public was more or less free to come and go. But it also made sense to hide some things in plain sight, where people will never look for them. True to our assignment, every last paper, flash drive, disk, current and obsolete form of digital storage, and binder had been rounded up and shipped off to be incinerated. 
I was part of the final walkthrough that would make sure that nothing had been overlooked. We split up and did it once over all the floors. Fallen behind a shelf on a sublevel was a single VHS tape. It was the only VHS tape that I had seen in the building. That was the only moment that I questioned if it would be worth risk of going to prison for the rest of my life. I kept it. I managed to smuggle it out of the building, and nobody caught me. My expectations for the tape were low. It would surely just be some personal project of some inventory. Manifest-related material. The first ten minutes were of the camera sitting on a table, filming an empty cage of sort. It was all metal, and the bars seemed or appeared to be very heavy. There were a host of locking mechanisms and levers, even gears. I think I saw buckles and straps, which made no sense. Then the film cut to a separate segment, where the cage was occupied. Whatever it was, it was crammed inside the cage, and it was not happy about it. It had no room to stand up or to sit down. The cage may as well have been an animal's coffin. I wanted to think it was some sort of gorilla, but even gorillas don't get that big. And gorillas also don't make sounds that fear-inspiring. The grainy quality of the tape made it impossible to pick out details of the black shape in the cage. Another jump cut to a small room, rectangular in shape with no windows and no visible doors. A hard-looking man, quite possibly a convict, was looking around with a very confused expression on his face. Tattooed from head to toe, he muttered something in Spanish. He moved across all the walls as if probing for an exit. Apparently, he was not made aware there was a camera. A handwritten title screen appeared that said Training 03A. The camera cut back to the convict, but there was a lot of action taking place. He was up against the wall shouting, rambling. A black shape came up to him and towered over him. It was muscular and furry, like someone in a Halloween costume. The thing made a motion as if slapping the man across the cheek. His cheek was sliced to ribbons, and the interior of his mouth was exposed. His tongue squirmed as he shrieked in pain and painted the floor with blood. The more the shape tore the man apart, the more it dawned on me that it wasn't somebody in a costume. This hulking creature was slowly tearing the man apart, flesh to bone, and it seemed to relish the experience. For the short time the man had lips, I think I heard him saying a prayer. Then, his face was no more. The animal studied his flesh as if studying it. It didn't like the sounds the man made, so it forced its paw down on the unprotected throat. You could see it being shredded. The video cut to another human prisoner, this time a woman. She was also butchered in a similar fashion. The being or creature was facing the camera, more in that one, and it looked everything like you'd expect a werewolf to look like. I so wanted it to be a costume, but that fakeness you expect from a mask wasn't there. Everything was just so alive and moving, brimming with intelligence of a predatory killer. There were twitches and ticks that could not be simulated by a costume. The woman's death was not slow. There was much more on the tape, but I could not watch. I mentally reviewed every square inch of the government building and couldn't recall anything that hinted at the presence of such thing. There may have been a sublevel, possibly. And that left me where I was before that I decided to ever submit this story. What do you do when you know something like this has happened? I can't show the tape for obvious reasons, and I don't dare identify myself. Who would put together such awful things? If that was indeed the work of the U.S. government, what were they trying to accomplish? My Uncle Brown talked me into going hunting with him. 
not the worst thing in the world, except my uncle was prone to drinking when out hunting. His chances of hitting a clear target were reduced exponentially, and his odds of hitting something he shouldn't went up by just as much. He told me that he wouldn't drink on that particular outing, but he cracked a beer as soon as we got out into the woods and said that he meant he wouldn't start drinking right away. So I hoped that the stink of beer would keep us from seeing any deer so the world would be safe from my uncle's shooting. No such luck. And there came a doe that was worthy of a magazine shoot. My uncle took a shot, and it was too sloppy. I don't even know where the shot went, but it did not hit the deer. He swore up a storm with slurred words and got himself yet another beer. I would have left him there, but the ride out there was his, and I shouldn't let him drive home in that condition. For whatever reason, my uncle took an interest in a fat squirrel that was leaping from tree to tree. It was the most embarrassing expenditure of ammunition I'd ever seen. The squirrel practically barked in protest, but I think my uncle interpreted it as laughter, so he was that much more determined to shoot a hole in that thing. He shot holes in lots of things, just not in the squirrel. This led to him having another fit and swearing and throwing down his rifle. He was about to stomp on it, but he lost his balance and he fell over to the side. We went for a short stroll and stopped at the top of a hill. My uncle indicated some animal of interest at the bottom of the hill. He summarized that it was a bear. I couldn't tell. It was big enough to be a bear, but there was a lot of underbrush and plants blocking my full view. He took yet another careless shot. Any other time he would have missed, but a yelp told me that the shot had landed true. I don't know that I'd ever seen an animal move so quickly. Whatever that was, it went flying up the side of the hill at my uncle, and I took the hint that it would be a great idea if I didn't just stand there and take it all in. Something like a wolf that walks on two legs did a dolphin dive up into the air coming down on my uncle. I landed the luckiest shot of my life with my own rifle. It blew one of its eyes, and it collapsed on top of the flailing drunk. He had a huge chunk bitten out of his shoulder, and it called for a trip to the ER. He wouldn't shut up about making sure nobody else bothered the corpse of the dog monster. But I was more worried about making sure he wasn't going to bleed out. Plus, I didn't fancy hunting with him a second longer than necessary. We got him all patched up, and he was itching to get back out to where we'd been to collect the carcass and whatever equipment we had left behind. I reluctantly agreed to go along with him for one trip back, as long as we weren't going to hunt. It took a few days before they'd let him go. The food we had left behind, including my uncle's beer, was ransacked probably the work of actual bears. The body of the wolf monster was gone, as luck would have it, either picked apart or carried away by another hunter. So to this day, the man tells the story about how he was nearly slain by the man-dog from hell, and how his quick reflexes were the only reason he's alive to this very day. He tells about how he had to calm me down while he was about to bleed out, so that I could drive him to the ER. I've stopped correcting him. It's his word against mine, and I'm the more sober of the two of us, so I figure anybody with any sense will understand that he's full of it. My name is Chelsea. I've hiked the same trails for the last 15 years, with nothing ever happening before. I'm still questioning if I accurately understood what I think I saw and heard. Last time I checked, Indiana is not a hotspot on the map for paranormal occurrences, one of the reasons why I felt safe over the years. I was with my boyfriend. We took our favorite trail. It was our favorite because it ended in a peak 
where we could watch the sunset with an unobstructed view. It was the perfect way to end our time together outdoors. The oxygen-rich air was always a consistent mood lift, and it made the tension of the week fall away, along with whatever difficulties we may have had with one another. We crested the top of the hill and stopped to catch our breath. The sunset did not disappoint. There were enough low-hanging clouds to catch the sky's fire. My boyfriend began massaging my shoulders I always felt a little closer to him after a hike. I was starting to lose my balance when I saw him come up the hillside in front of me. He apologized, saying the wind has caught his cap. My blood ran cold as I connected the dots. If my boyfriend was right there in front of me, who was gripping my shoulders? I screamed and jumping forward, turning around to see who had invaded my personal space. There was nobody. I looked around, frantically. There was no way that they had gotten very far. As soon as I could see who they were, I was going to sick my boyfriend on them in a heartbeat. We were the only two people on the hill, and I tried to enjoy the rest of the night. I really did, but it was difficult. Somebody was rubbing my shoulders and when I saw my boyfriend, the sensation persisted, so I knew it was not him. I've asked him if he saw anything when he came up the hill. He said that he did not. It even entered my mind that he was pulling a fast one over me with one of his friends. But he's not prone to devious behavior, and I can't think of anybody that would be bored enough for such a stunt. Besides, my boyfriend doesn't like anybody touching me but him. We still go out there, but it isn't the same, and my boyfriend hangs closer to me, even though he has never fully committed to believing my story. He respects my feelings more than he respects my account. Has anybody else had something like this happen to them? I was long overdue for some time on the lake with one of my favorite cousins. He was the brother that I always wanted, but never had. We stayed thick, well into our adult years. The ins and outs of raising families and making a living forced us into those long spells of silence. Of course, but when we finally reconnected, it was as if we never lost touch. It was a beautiful thing. We finally worked out a weekend where it would just be him and I out on a lake of our choice. Good fishing and good beer. We were both excited, and our wives even joked that they'd divorce us just so he and I could get married. He did look the way I remembered him, but he had a little more gray on his chin. There wasn't much silence and we had plenty to catch up on. I had more or less resigned myself to the idea that we weren't going to catch on anything since we were talking so much. He was in the middle of a story about confronting his wife's brother for something when I caught a whiff of something terrible. My inner Sherlock, Holmes, was triggered. We weren't that close to shore where stagnant water would have a chance to waft in our direction then, I heard something that sounded like a fart, so I grimaced, and it was still terrible, but hey, we're guys. Being able to do that sort of thing without being henpecked was the whole point of getting out on the lake, so I didn't say anything. But my cousin looked around, asked what the awful smell was. I searched his face for any hint or inkling of irony or joking. I could tell he was serious. We both heard the sound, the one that sounded embarrassing. We could both tell it was not coming from either one of us. We both looked at the water, and I didn't see anything for several long seconds. But then, 
I saw something pulpy and long brushing the sides of our boat. I thought they were fish or snakes at first, but then one of them began feeling up the side of the boat. I was no marine biologist, but I know a tentacle when I see one. The part that made my heart start hammering was the fact that there was something like teeth on the underside of the tentacle, either for grasping or for tearing, or both. My cousin says that he never saw it, but I did, and that was enough to make me call it a day. I fired up the motor, and I swear the boat hesitated for a moment, as if in the grasp of something from underneath. But then we were free, and we made it back to safety. He still thinks I'm a little delusional. He doesn't know what I saw, but he's convinced that it wasn't just some unidentified sea monster. My eyes are just fine, and so is my judgment. I may not know what I saw either, but I swear that it was dangerous and it was big enough to manhandle our entire boat. I had a horrible experience. One, when camping, that still freaks me out to this day. Nobody else saw it. Only me, despite the sight being fairly full. But I believe it was real. I was with my family, my parents and three much younger siblings. In another tent was my aunt, uncle, plus two younger cousins. I was the only teen. And still, I got on fine with everybody and was happy to muck in and help out. Because of this, they were happy to let me do my own thing sometimes and head off to try to find some kids closer to my age or join in the activities. Or even just to chill on my own for a bit and some much needed quiet time away. It was on one of those evenings having spent most of the day in the lake with the small fry, that I decided to head into the woods for some much needed alone time. Mainly, as I had overheard a couple of girls whispering about some possible late night skinny dipping, I knew there was a decent view of the lake from the trees. You gotta remember as I tell you this, it was the late 80s and I was 14, full of hormones and yet to even kiss a girl. That sort of temptation was too hard to pass up. It was later then that I usually allowed to it as it got pretty dark. But I had been such a good big brother, they were letting me stay up later and later. I was just about to reach the spot in the trees where you could peek through and see the lake. I could already hear the girls splashing. When I heard something closer than the sounds of the girls, much closer, like just a couple of trees over. The noise was like twigs and leaves crunching alongside heavy panting. I admit, at first, I thought maybe it was another guy watching the girls. Even though I was embarrassed and didn't want to get myself caught, my teenage curiosity got the better of me ultimately and I needed to know who this other person was. I managed to get myself into an almost crouching position, stealthily moved across to see who had the same idea. What I saw, I will never forget. No, it wasn't a guy, not even a person. I don't think it could have been a person. To start with, they were covered in hair, now, since it was dark, I will always be grateful for that, as it did not see me. I didn't get the best look at it. How much I 100% remember, and how much I filled in with imagination, I don't know for certain. There was some light coming from the moon. That gave me just enough light to see this thing next to me, covered in dark hair. And then I also saw the wings two large scaly black wings close to its body. It was watching the girls, but it did not seem to be doing anything like I had been there. No, 
it appeared to be looking at them like with hunger, rather than lust. Its head was kind of like a bird, which would also account for the wings. But it looked hairy and scaly, not feathery, kind of like a man-sized bird thing, with a humanish face with a sort of hooked beak for a nose. That's the best I can do. Because then it let out this humongous scream, and it screeched right back at me, and then flew up into the air, as if somebody had a bungee cord on it. I think I probably fainted, as the next thing I remember is being woken up by some concerned-looking workers from the camp, and my dad carrying me back. I didn't tell them the whole truth, about why I had been there. I said that I'd be getting some fresh air when I had heard some strange noises, and went to investigate. I told them that I had found a strange man standing there, watching the girls, and had screamed to alert them. I was deemed a hero. The police took a statement, and did a search, but, of course, they found nothing. Other than some really odd footprints, close to where they had found mine, which did not make much sense, as they seemed to have claw marks. I own horses, and have been around them since I was a kid, and am extremely confident and competent with them. In many ways, I prefer the company of them to people. You always know where they are with a horse. I have a huge ranch, and as well as my own, I stable others. It's a decent enough way to make a living, and the owners all trust me implicitly. I have had rescues and ex-race horses that I've rehabbed, and even a mare who had been severely abused. She had to be kept all on her own, away from the others, and wouldn't let any man near her. Only me and one other female could come into her stable without all hell breaking loose. And, since she is so vulnerable, God help anyone who provoked her. They'd be fired on the spot, and if she gave them a swift parting kick, so be it. So when I woke up one night to hear a hell of a commotion going on down there, I was furious. Who was upsetting my babies? They sounded scared, panicked, and most of all, I could hear the mare going absolutely crazy. When she came to me, her legs were injured from trying to kick down the stable wall to get away from her abuser. Since she was safe with me, there had been no further incidents of her getting injured. But now, I recognize that terrified whimper and the sound of a body being thrown up against the wall. Something had spooked them, but her bad enough to set off her old injuries if she did not stop trying to ram the wall. I grabbed my shotgun, raced out to see what was out there. At that point, I wasn't thinking about my own safety, whether there might have been a wolf or bear out there waiting for a meal. Besides, I was armed, but all I was really concerned about were the horses, and specifically my mare. I sped to the stables and immediately saw what was causing the chaos. Something was standing right outside the mare's stall, something I had never seen before. It was quite small, possibly around five feet and squat, like it was as round as it was tall. I have absolutely no idea what it was, but if you were to put the gun to my head and say what, you, what was your gut feeling, I would say goblin. A goblin? That's nuts, right? But that's the only thing I could think of as I looked at this grotesque looking thing. It was naked and had a pale pinkish skin tone. It looked to be completely bald and it was fat and round, and it had these droopy layers of flesh covering up any private bits. The reason it made me think of a goblin was mainly its face, which was all screwed up and very pointy and sharp-featured. 
It even had these awful sharp bat-like ears sticking out. It was completely fixated on the mare, who was still going nuts and trying to break out. I quickly fired a shot into the air. A warning. This thing turned slowly, looked at me face on. I was very glad those extra rolls of fat. It held up one clawed hand, and I could see long pointy fingers. Then, it stuck out its enormous tongue, in an almost leering fashion, just before I could get another shot off. It appeared to vanish. The very second it seemed to disappear into thin air, the atmosphere changed again, and all the horses, even the mare, seemed to calm back down. I stayed with them for another hour, checking all around the stalls and the perimeter of the ranch, but nothing. I never saw that vile creature ever again after that, and I still haven't since this happened. I was washing my fillet knife in a creek when my girlfriend cried out in the distance. She had said something about investigating a beehive she thought she had seen from a distance and was going for a little honey hunting adventure. I came running. It's a good thing I did, because if I had been any further away, I might not have heard her screaming turn muffled. Something stood over my girlfriend. Something humanoid. It had dry-looking gray skin that revealed the movement of every single muscle fiber and tendon. If that wasn't bad enough, in place of a face, it had a mass of feelers like a sea thing and they were completely engulfing my girlfriend's face and lifting her up off the ground. It looked like it was trying to swallow her head first. I panicked. Her oxygen was going to run out. So time was not on my side. I had almost forgotten my fillet knife, and I thanked God that I had it on me. I flew at the creature to stab it in its side. I expected it to just slide right in, and then I would twist it. It was like stabbing a sack of concrete. The knife went in, but it met with a lot of resistance. This thing didn't cry out, twitch or anything. A whole new wave of urgency swept through me. I began stabbing wherever I could, at the shoulder blades, the spinal column, at the base of the neck. This thing just kept sucking on my girlfriend's face who whimpered pitifully as she began to lose consciousness. I tried the feelers in desperation. Finally, there was a reaction. The monster flinched, swung at me, causing a few more tendrils to come loose. This tested my bravery, since its sensitive point was in its face, where I'd have to confront it. The knife found more dull matter in its stomach so I made another lunge at the feelers. It didn't like it. I got raked with those claws, which were more like long old lady fingernails. Something about that was more frightening than it should have been. Then it changed the fact that I loved my girlfriend. Another swipe at the feelers showed that it had a ring of eyes under the first ring of feelers, and that's where I jabbed. That's what got the thing to let go of my girlfriend's face. I got a second wind and stabbed at it as many of those tiny eyes as I could. Its scream was wet and ugly, like it wasn't made for breathing the air. It fell backwards, and I stumbled, landed on top of it. I got ready for more strikes, but the claws slashed across my face in three lightning quick strokes. The world turned upside down and it was gone. I must have blacked out. I woke up in a hospital. EMTs told me that my girlfriend phoned 911 and gotten me to care, which told me all I really cared about, which was that she's okay. I was more than a little upset that she told them nothing more than I had been attacked by a mountain lion. 
there was going to be so many inconsistencies in that account. She thought that what really happened would be beyond believing, and she did not want to get mistaken for being a mad woman and put away. I still owed her for getting me to emergency services, so I couldn't be too mad. Man, things are really crazy when you look back on these kind of situations. This was back in 1995, and I haven't looked back since. I was a crewman on a road crew here in Illinois, around the neighborhood of Bement. When you're not from Illinois, the term middle of nowhere seems to apply to the entire state, but when you're around someplace like Bement, then you're in the middle of nowhere. The location wasn't just rural, the location was just plain empty. There was the road, there was us, the crew, and there was grass and corn. That's it. We were working on, you guessed it, a road, and we were coming up on an older bridge that would need to be included in the project, but there would need to be an inspection first. I told one of my crewmates to make sure that the thing wasn't going to collapse, and also to check that there weren't any wild animals or vagrants underneath the bridge before we began our work. Wild animals were more likely. No homeless person in the right mind was going to be camping out in a location that remote. Not unless they were a serial killer. I should have gone looking for him when he was taking too long, but I got handed a piping cup of coffee and didn't think anything of letting my crewmate take his time. I'm ashamed to say that I kind of forgot about him. One of the other guys came looking for him, and I told him that he was under the bridge, making an inspection before we begin work on the bridge. So, he too went under the bridge. He also did not come back up. I didn't notice, though, until I put my nose into my coffee for another sip, and I smelled something really harsh. I stood at attention, looking into my cup. That's when I noticed the smell wasn't coming from my coffee. It was coming from somewhere around, somewhere around me. I felt a singing feeling in my stomach, and I realized that it was coming from under the bridge. Whatever it was was upwind of me. I tried not to look as urgent as I felt. I saw tall grasses and scrubby weeds. I saw the shadows hugging the corners where the ground and concrete met. Then, I saw the faintest red lights. It was overcast, so it was easy to pick out. For a moment, I thought that I had seen evil red eyes but then I realized they were just embers. I smelt something burning, a combination of burning cloth and perhaps human hair, the horrible odor that I had thought was coming from my coffee. In short, because it messes me up to tell this part, I found the two bodies of my workmates. They looked like they had been incinerated, and they were two masses of cinders waiting for a breeze to blow them away. I don't remember much after that. My crew told me that I screamed out loud and everybody came running and saw me with the two bodies. The account was so far-fetched that law enforcement went over the case with a fine-toothed comb, being slow to believe that the two burnt corpses were who I said they were but there weren't any alternative explanations. Somehow, my men had been flash-cooked on the spot. I was a prime suspect, sure, but nobody could explain how I could do such a thing. People don't realize how non-combustible the human body is, and those two were burnt all the way to the core. Another reason identification was delayed. They didn't fire me like I thought they would, but it did not take long for me to resign. Every day that I showed up, I felt like I could have done something more to keep my men from getting incinerated. 
I'm disgusted by coffee, even though I'm still addicted to it. This life has turned very ugly. I can't bear to live and can't do anything to die. I'm hoping somebody out there will reach out and tell me they've heard of anything remotely like this happening. I decided to take some time off from work and head out to a cabin that I had inherited in Tennessee. I don't care what the stereotype of a city businessman is. If I don't get back to nature at some point, well, I snap. I could tell that point was coming up. So I dropped everything, delegated what I could, and said screw the rest. I was off to my cabin. It was warmer weather, so the shade of the pines was welcoming and comforting. At the time, I had found it reassuring that the nearest road was over a mile away. I would soon find this to be a huge setback. I also didn't pay much as attention as I should have to the peculiar growths that had formed on the side of the cabin. It was all along the bottom near the ground, some sort of fungus, but it wasn't black mold, so I wasn't worried. I settled in, not fully realizing just how exhausted I was until I had stopped moving. I left a good deal of the stuff out in my truck, but I did not care. I was so far off the beaten path that no criminal was going to work that hard to rob me. I'd get everything else the next day. Before I knew it, I was out. I awoke to the sensation of being tied up. It almost made sense that my one break that I get from work is the time that somebody chooses to ambush me. But I wasn't tied with ropes. I was anchored down by something ropey and slimy and cold. It formed a webbing over me, like it had grown over me while I was asleep. My imagination ran wild, and I imagined that I had been cocooned by giant spiders. But no, I wasn't hanging from the ceiling. I was in bed, where I had fallen asleep, just webbed over by some strange pale pinkish blue fibers that were much stronger than they looked to be. If I had been any weaker, I'd still be on that bed. I tore the weave of strange fibers off me, kicked them down, and I swear, I saw some of them writhing a little. I looked around, noticed that the entire bedroom had some traces of the fibers, like they had grown all over while I was asleep. I didn't think that I had been out that long, but it was pretty dark in the cabin. I looked around, noticed that there were chinks of daylight peeking through a mass of fibers that had overgrown the window from the outside. My heart began to beat faster as I ran to the front door and tried to open it, but it was sealed shut. Those strange fibers had even grown in the space between the door and the jam, so the door wasn't even wiggling in place. I tried to calm myself, sat down at the breakfast table to think for a moment. The fibers were there too. I eyed the fibers clinging to the table, more like I watched the contact point between the table and the fibers. There was definitive movement. It was very slow, faster than a houseplant, but slower than a snail, and it was moving in my direction. I was just as fascinated as I was horrified. I did try to maintain a rational approach and decided to call 911. I found that my phone had been the things a monk left outside. My saving grace was a wood axe that I had brought inside years back. I took that old beater and I began scraping at the scummy fibers, clogging everything, trying to avoid the door if I could help it. Well, it couldn't be helped. Even after demolishing the door, there was a solid web of the fibers on the other side, but they weren't a match for the old axe. 
I eventually got to my phone, called 911, and told them about what had happened, that they should send some sort of wildlife patrol. Well, you'd never believe me, but not only did I get an ambulance, I got a full black sedan of men in dark suits. The EMT crew was a little more forceful than I had expected them to be. They had all but stated that I was going to be with them, whether I liked it or not. When I got to leave the hospital, my car and all my belongings were waiting for me outside, but I was informed that the cabin was entirely demolished and essentially removed from existence. The strangest thing I have ever had happen in my life. I had been driving all over the county. It was dark, and I was tired. Thankfully, my wife was with me, chatting and keeping me awake. We'd been delivering care packages to members of our families, who at the time were unable to get to the stores and needed to stay inside due to COVID. I was exhausted. The black coffee I had been inhaling for the last couple of hours was the only thing keeping my eyes from closing. Thank God my wife was chatting away and keeping watch of the road ahead, as it was her scream that allowed me to ram my foot on the brake as this creature ran out in front of us. Despite having my headlights on full beam, I wasn't able to get a great look at it, mainly because I didn't know what the hell it was. It shot across our path like a blur, then seemed to stand stock still in a daze at the sight of the car. In just those short seconds, between catching sight of it and slamming the brakes on, it looked the size of a bear in height, yet also really skinny, like it was starving. It seemed to have an overly large head as it stared at the car, and we saw two huge white eyes and what looked like a large circular mouth. Then, slam, I hit it. I hadn't wanted to, and I hope you believe that. I am the type of man who will catch a bug in the house and release it outside, even though I had no idea what this was. I had tried to break in time. The force of the impact caused the creature to slam off the hood of the car, but luckily we were fine, except for being shocked. I made to open my door, to go check on it, but my wife gave me that, didn't you see that thing? We need to get out of here now, look. So I swerved around the lump in the road, and we headed home, in silence. I could not stop thinking about the creature though. Not only what was it, but had I killed it? I had to go back and check. The following morning, I drove back to the same spot where I'd hit it, driving up and down the road as I wasn't sure of the exact spot, and then I saw the blood, lots of blood. I felt awful. Since there was no obvious sign of the animal, I decided to get out and have a look. When I examined the blood, it was even more strange. There was some gray fleshy looking lumps and also feathers feathers seemed to make less and less sense of what I had already seen. The blood trail seemed to cross over towards the woods on the opposite side of the road. I walked over, looking through the trees. I could see blood right up until one extremely large tree. Then it appeared to just disappear, as if the creature had climbed up the tree, which made no sense. I drove up and down the road several more times over the following few weeks, going actively out of my way to try and find that creature. I was driving myself and my wife mad. I googled and searched for hours, but I could not find anything to match what we had seen. I guess I'll never know what it was if it had survived. I come from a hunting family. Hunting family, hunting buddies. 
We have dogs that are used to coming out with us. They are brave, loyal, and fierce. In all the times I've been out with people and the dogs, they have never let us down. They would die to protect us and probably enjoy the fight, which is what makes this story so much more weird. We were out as usual one evening. The dogs were riled up and ready to go. We had picked up a very decent trail and they were following the scent for us. There were three of us, three dudes, all longtime hunters, five dogs between us, all experienced. One male in particular, a real mean pit bull, literally bred to hunt and fight, had taken the lead, all fired up over what they could smell. All of a sudden, we heard a noise, not unusual of course, would have been weirder not to hear anything, only this was like nothing any of us had ever heard. Three guys with years of experience between us, and we all looked at each other, like, what was that? The dogs all stopped too, like something out of a cartoon, where the dog stops still and acts like a pointer. Even the big brave pit, who had been snarling and gagging for something to rip apart, went quiet. We did the typical guy thing, of trying to make light of it, laughing, making noises and laughing. The kind of thing you do when you're scared, but you don't want anybody else to know, so you act the fool instead. Then, all five dogs began howling too. But unlike us, real low long howls, as if they were answering some unknown force. They didn't sound like they were ferocious beasts. They sounded like they were showing their subservience. It was eerie. We called to them, but they wouldn't budge. The hound, who I'd seen rip out the throat of a large buck once, lay on the floor exposing his belly. Okay, something was going on. Then, we heard the noise again, and this time it made my blood run cold. Despite the many layers, I felt chilled and something I had not experienced in a long time out here. Fear. Usually, I am pumped full of excitement and adrenaline. I know, between the mutts and my shotgun, I'm safe against anything the woods has to offer. But right at that moment, I honestly didn't feel like I would get out of there alive. We hadn't even seen anything yet, just heard the sound. You may notice I haven't actually told you what the sound was. And that is because it was almost impossible for me to describe. But if I had to, I would say the best comparison would be the mix between a wolf howl and the screech of a bird of prey, like an eagle. And then, it stepped out of the woods, as I said. Until then, the big brave had been howling and showing how submissive they were. Now, having seen this thing better than us, with their eyes being used to the dark, they went into a full-on panicked frenzy mode, whining, whimpering, crying. One just started pooping everywhere. Another actually made a run for it, and we heard it trying to head back towards the truck. Now, if I thought describing the noise was hard, then trying to tell you what we saw it's almost impossible, mainly because we had never seen anything like it, and I was honestly beginning to wonder if I was somehow hallucinating, if the other guys and the dogs hadn't have the same reaction. Because what was standing by the trees was something like out of a horror movie, big, tall, mean looking, it wasn't big body wise but it looked like its body was stretched. Really long arms that almost touched the ground, but short legs in comparison. The torso was way out of proportion. It appeared to be, from what we could tell, covered in dark gray hair. 
although it looked patchy in places, like dead skin or mange. Its hands and feet were huge, and again, looked totally out of place with how skinny it was. This all led up to the face, that in some hellish way looked somewhat human. I say somewhat. The features were like that, like the shape of the mouth, nose, and eyes, although they were all distorted and stretched across the enormous skull. This was almost oval in shape rather than round. It appeared to have no fear of us or the dogs whatsoever, and I'll admit, I just wanted to haul out right there. But Trigger Happy Petey decided to offload a few hundred bullets into that thing. Okay, well, maybe not a hundred plus bullets, but more than I can count. It just stood there. I don't know whether those bullets went through it, or just did not penetrate the skin. But the thing stood there and took it, and I did not see a speck of blood or any sign of tissue damage. That was it. I had no issues if they called me a wimp. I was gone. Turns out they were right behind me. Dogs and all. We jumped in the truck and hightailed it back home. We've talked and talked about just what the thing could have been. I reckon it was at least eight foot tall, so I can't see any way in hell it could have been a human. Even if it was one of those hillbilly deliverance or melon head types. So, I'm asking you, what in God's name did we see that day? I awoke around 6 a.m. with a full bladder and a loaded torpedo bay. There was no sleeping throughout it, so I got up, lightened my load. There is a narrow window in my bathroom, just big enough for me to see the sky, not much else. There was the beginning of daylight. It was still too early for me, and my first priority was getting back to bed as soon as possible. The sleepiness came back as soon as I had finished doing my business, and I made my way back to bed. About two minutes back into getting settled under the covers, I heard strange noises coming from just outside. My place is just isolated enough that the slightest sound of company gets my attention. You don't just find my home on accident. You have to be looking for it. But the sounds I was hearing didn't put me in the mind of people. At first, it was this grunting that kind of reminded me of a bear. But then there were some snarls and snorting I'd never heard a bear make before. And trust me, I've met my share of bears. There was another sound I'd heard from a bear, some sort of barking noise, as if a stray dog had made its way onto my property. I would have to make sure it wasn't going to be a threat before I would attempt to leave my house. A cursory glance through my window showed me nothing. It was then, when I looked through the living room window, I saw something. But even then, I wasn't ready to accept what my eyes were telling me. My brain's very first reaction was that I was looking at someone that had been living in the wilderness for a very, very long time. Then, I began to process all the little signs that this thing wasn't even remotely human. He, or it, stared at me intently, which should have been impossible. There was no way that it could see me through the window like that. Its stocky frame was solid and muscular, covered in silvery white fur with what appeared to be a black outline. It had long black ears standing straight up, seeming to be alert to any sounds. I saw a long snout and it twitched as it appeared to keep sampling the air. The final detail my brain let in was the long and lethal nature of the claws. They looked like they were purposely designed for a life of combat. What happened next was the worst possible thing for any man in my situation. My brain questioned whether I left the front door unlocked or not. As soon as I moved to check the front door, this monstrous wolf thing darted towards it. 
I didn't know how something with those kinds of claws would be able to handle the doorknob. But I wasn't going to give this thing a chance. It was further away from the door than I, but we reached for it at the same time. I fumbled and tumbled the deadbolt into place, not a moment too soon. The knob twisted wildly, but the door held fast. I staggered back, breathing a sigh of relief, and those awful claws made the glass of the door into a spiderweb of cracks. The arm that came through the window was more muscular than it had appeared from far away. It fumbled for the lock. If this was a wild animal, it knew something about doors, and I knew that I had to be disappearing if I wanted to live. I began running deeper into the house, shutting and locking every door behind me. The monster slammed against the first barrier, hard enough to knock picture frames off the walls and shatter against the floor. I desperately reached into my memory for any hint of having something that could make me equal to this clear and present danger in my life. My father had left me his Colt 1911. I had it up in a box in the attic. I went into the room with access to the attic, pulling the staircase down from the ceiling with a rope, but not before shutting and locking the room's door. I heard the first locked door buckle under the strength of the monster. I clambered up into the heat of the attic, and I went straight to the old burrow where the colt lay inside a box. My heart sank when I saw that it was still disassembled. All those years, and I hadn't bothered to put it together. But seeing the loaded magazine was the kick I needed. So, I cobbled the piece together with shaking hands while standing on a shaking floor. Each time this monster threw itself against a new barrier, the entirety of the house shook. No sooner had I loaded the magazine and chambered around than I saw the black shape of the wolf monster coming up into the attic with me. I had forgotten to retract the stairs, and in the dimness of the attic, I was able to see the gentle light coming out of its eyes. They were this rustic coppery orange, like a wick of a candle. My ears rang from the shots as I unleashed the bullets. The shots that landed on its torso and shoulder just seemed to irritate it. It was the one that penetrated its skull right next to its eye that made it change its mind. I saw some matted fur and blood shower the floor. It howled in pain and fear and rolled down the stairs. I'm guessing to the door where it came in. I stared down at the remnants I left behind. I was pretty sure I would be facing off with this thing again had it decided to come back. I don't know what on earth this was, and I really don't care. I'll do whatever it takes to kill it next time it comes. Yeah, I don't think I'm going to be involving the police. I can't possibly see any reason how they would be of any help. Not in something like this. Really, what would I tell them? A werewolf broke into my house and tried to kill me? Yeah, right. I feel like I'm pretty much on my own with this one. So, maybe if I thought I reached out to cryptid investigators, or people like you, I could see some real answers. I think the world's forgotten just how much wilderness Nevada truly has. Mention Elko, Nevada, and most people go, oh, slot machines. People like me that are actually from around the area know that the casinos of Elko are but a dim campfire in Nevada's vast outdoors. We were actually in the wilderness, nearly Elko, in July of 2008. It was a camping trip with my family. We were in the mountains between Elko and Wells. We had gotten the hard part of getting our shelter set up and out of the way. All we needed was materials to start a fire. We had propane as a backup, but what's a camping trip without a real fire? I headed deep into the timber to start collecting dry twigs and bigger where I could find them. I thought I'd hit the jackpot when I found a fallen tree that was completely dried out. I was going to go back to our campsite for my hatchet when I heard a bestial and guttural sound coming from all around me. The echoes of the trees made it difficult to pinpoint. It had come up from behind me, behind the fallen tree. 
It was a gray, furry humanoid creature standing on two legs, wolf-like, and it began circling the tree, walking upright with no problems. That's when I noticed that the legs were naturally bipedal. The knees bent, just like a human's. My first thought was that it was some sort of canine creature, even though the face wasn't exactly dog-like. There was just enough human in it to make me wonder if werewolves are real. The face did have a longer snout. Longer than a dog's, but shorter than a wolf's. And the eyes were beady and dark red. In the twilight, there was just enough dimness for me to see the redness, and also a slight glow, I feel. I felt like I was confronting some crossroads of the unnatural and unholy. I had babbled the prayers I had memorized as a boy in Catholic college, but the creature didn't seem to be that impressed. Maybe the devil wasn't involved in what I was encountering, but from the looks of those claws and teeth, this thing was more than capable of doing the devil's work. In desperation, I reached into my back pocket, took out a flare and a lighter, and brought the sparkling, hissing red beacon to life, and I waved it in a wide, slow arc. This stole the monster's attention, and part of me wished that I had been a firecracker. I grasped just enough bravery to step forward, making jabs at the creature with a flare, but it started swatting at the light with its gigantic hook-like claws, and my courage shrank back. But something told me that I didn't want to drop that flare. I wasn't sure if the light was disorientating or what, but where the flare went, its eyes went. The flare sputtered unexpectedly, showering this thing with sparks, and after a few furious swipes, I thought I would end up getting shredded alive. But this thing retreated. Anyway, I told my family what was going on and we cut out camping trips short. They don't really believe me to this day, so I'm sharing my story with you. Maybe you and your listeners will believe me. I live in Michigan, in a very rural area. The town I live near is very small and surrounded by lots of woods. On the outskirts of this town are farms that extend for miles and miles until you find another farm. I have always been interested in cryptids, mainly Bigfoot, Yeti, Icky Man. When I was about 13, my father took me out to his garage so we could go hunting because he thought he had heard something outside. He was pretty startled by what he saw. At first, I thought we were looking at a homeless man looking for a space to bed down. I wondered why he was wearing such a thick fur coat. But that's when I realized that was its fur. And it was not a man. It stood up from a crouching position, trying to make itself look as big as possible. We had some dog years ago that looked like a burly wolf. This looked like her distant cousin if dogs could comfortably stand up on their hind legs. The lips pulled back to reveal gums that were almost as long as the teeth. The claws at its side twitched. It was a complete portrait of a living, breathing, killing machine. I don't think I'd ever been more scared in my life. I wanted to cry, but... I also didn't want to show any weakness in front of my father. My dad spoke to me in a low, shivering voice. He said, we needed to back up. We had it cornered in the garage. We didn't want to make it feel threatened. I eyeballed the wood axe directly behind the wolf thing. Even if I could reach it in record time, with the help of the adrenaline, the creature was surely faster. So I nodded in agreement. We slowly backed up with our hands out, trying to look as non-threatening as possible. It seemed to get the message, but it kept its head low and its lips pulled back. It slowly left the garage and began walking around us in a circle. Something told me that it wasn't going to leave the yard. I acted on impulse and ran for the wood axe as soon as I thought I had a chance. I don't think it expected this. I mean... It actually made it over and got the axe in my hands. I knew that I didn't have time to think, 
so I swung around blindly. The beast's claws were less than six inches away from my face when the back of the axe struck it across the skull. It staggered back and did the unexpected. It fled. I looked at my father in disbelief. He gave me the same look. It's one of those stories you want to tell people, and you want people to believe. But people would think I'm nuts, even with my dad corroborating my tale. So I'm sharing it with you, hopefully to get some answers on what this could have been. I've heard of things like the Michigan Dogman, but I'm not all too sure that's exactly what this was. This is a true story of my experience with some sort of unknown canid creature in the woods of Northern California. My first encounter happened late one evening when I was out camping at Lake Davis. Lake Davis is just north of Sacramento in the Deptford area. I could see that something looked to be like a golden brown color in the distance. At first, it appeared to be like a lion. I was petrified, but as I looked closer, it was not a lion, but like a dog and a man, but some weird hybrid creature, kind of like a lion, a dog, and a man. I say that because it was wolfish, but also walking upright, and reminded me of a lion in the sense where it had a very large mane on the upper part of its head and neck. It was pretty tall, too about six foot. Its face was, as I already said, wolfish, with huge jaws that looked like they could do some serious damage. I was terrified, and went even to call the Coast Guard. Of course, I couldn't get an answer, and looking back, I don't think they would have taken me so seriously. Eventually, this thing disappeared in the woods, and that was the end of my day. To this day, I still have no idea what on earth kind of creature I saw. My family and I were hunting for deer in the Pecano Mountains of Pennsylvania. It was a cold, frosty winter day, right around noon. My dad had just shot a nice six-point buck about 30 minutes before. Then we had heard some rustling in the bushes behind us. Then... From what sounded like a half mile away, there was growling. We both looked around and saw the most bizarre, terrifying creature we had both ever seen. It loomed large and was cracking branches with its jaws, angrily staring at us with this cold, calculated stare. And to my eyes, I had never seen such a creature before. As I looked to my father, I realized he hadn't either. His face was white, and his mouth was slightly open, in this expression of subdued terror. To see my dad in such a pitiful state was very distressing to me as a child. But what was before us was even worse. It was a large wolf creature that had large fangs, grayish fur, and navy fur with clumps missing, which revealed open wounds. Its face kind of resembled that of a wolf and a man. The eyes were much more human. A very angry expression laid on its face, revealed dagger-like fangs. I have since never forgotten the incident, and I have drawn many pictures of it since. Maybe I'll have to go and dig an old one out and send it to you. That was 35 years ago now, but nothing has ever came close to the disturbing outline of that creature in real life. I have since joined many online forms of the paranormal and cryptozoology, connecting with other people who have supposedly seen similar creatures. I feel that our government have withheld much information, not only about extraterrestrials, but also about creatures such as the one I encountered. Perhaps, if people knew these existed, they would never venture out into nature or even have pets of their own. There has to be answers out there. My father died without them, and I feel it's my mission to find a resolution for the many who have been left distressed and made to feel crazy 
after seeing the terrifying sights of unidentified creatures. I was only about 15 at the time. My older brother, who was about 10 years older than I, had found a good camping spot in a very deep part of the woods. He told me that we were going to camp there for a good three days. So, my friends and I decided they'd come with us, since they all lived in town. We pack up, set up camp. On our first night, it rained pretty heavy, and it gave me this sense of foreboding. Perhaps we had been hearing strange sounds all day, I don't know. As if something was following us in the forest. I had this dreaded feeling, like a premonition. As if something was going to attack us, or we were in danger. I couldn't shake it off. Then, on our first night, everything just made sense. I got up during the night to pee, and I did so in a secluded area of the campsite. I heard a strange crackling sound behind me, as if somebody was cracking branches. I turned around, feeling a sense of dread and icy fear all over. Before me, about five feet away was the strangest dog I had ever seen. It was covered in dark fur. Its head was like that of a Doberman pincher. It was kind of emaciated and sickly looking. I felt sick to my stomach and tried to run back to the campsite. But it was as if I was in a dream and my legs could not move. I was sure I was going to die on the spot. I closed my eyes and counted to ten, hoping this thing would be gone. And when I opened them, mercifully, it was gone. I thanked God, returning to my tent, where I did not sleep a wink. I have no idea to this day what I saw, but I know it was something demonic. I still have trouble sleeping and hope that I can connect with other people who have maybe seen something similar. Maybe we can start some sort of support group. For all I know, this thing has killed people. It is petrifying and disturbing to think about. The world sure is a scary place. I was hiking along a river, the bank of which is populated with thickets and heavy brush. I paused to build up some strength for a final push. Every muscle in my body ached from the workout as I stood there breathing heavily. The heat alone had gotten me, and sweat dripped slowly down into my eyes. I had no idea why I did this to myself, but I really wanted to get into the army within the next year, and I knew I needed to build up strength. I didn't want to be the sissy my dad and brothers said I was anymore, so I sucked it up and kept moving. Although, as I moved along, I felt what was normal pain. This was an entirely different sensation. It was as if something was stinging or stabbing my lower leg. I yelled out in agony, falling onto the stones by the river's side. The pain of the fall was nowhere near as the sore as the stabbing pain on my lower thigh. I looked down and saw that I had a huge wound, as if something had bit me. It was bleeding profusely and had a yellowish slime or gunk all around it. I felt sick immediately. I looked around to see what it was that bit me when I saw a terrifying sight. It was three wolves, standing, about six feet tall, matted gray fur all over their body. They had huge six-packs, ripped muscles. I'm talking these things were big. They looked like three meatheads at a gym. It was terrifying. I was thinking I was hallucinating. I looked at the river and saw the water, clear as crystal, and even contemplated jumping in. The wolves seemed to make a symbol with their hand, waving their hands in various directions. Then, one of them reached out its hand. On its palm, I could see my torn flesh and what appeared to be a fragment of my bone. I reached for the branch over me with all my strength, diving into the water. I knew if I had gotten into the river, I would be safe, and at least the wound would be washed somewhat. I let the river take me about five miles downstream when I waved some hikers down, and they even got me airlifted to the local hospital. 
I spent six weeks after I contracted sepsis. The ER doctors had never seen such a wound before. When I told them my story, they thought I was having a nervous breakdown. So, it's been many years since that incident, and I still can't go near force, or trees, or anywhere near dogs for that matter. Needless to say, I never joined the army, and my dad and brothers still think I'm a sissy. But I know what I saw. It was terrifying. Like, I had trespassed into some ancient ritualistic site where demonic things happen. I will never forget it, and hope to connect with other survivors of similar incidents. Perhaps somebody can inform me if I may have saw the famous Dogman of Michigan... I live in Kansas, Missouri, and I love going hiking at all the many state parks here. One day, two friends and myself were looking for something to do, so we decided that a great idea would be to go camping. We found out on the internet that there was an old campground just outside of a town called Ponds Creek Campground. It was pretty deserted when we arrived, kids' play park also being empty. I looked around and I wondered if it was closed, but no such signs or indications of closure were evident. So, I just kept walking. We were walking for around 20 minutes when I heard banging overhead. When I looked up, I saw something hiding within the trees. It was unlike any creature I had ever seen before. It was dog-like with a large abdomen covered in grayish fur but it had two long legs that made it appear extremely tall. I was holding on to my two friends as we all looked up. We were shaking. The creature looked down at us and proceeded to hiss at us. We all decided to walk back slowly. We walked backwards, keeping an eye on this creature. It slithered up and down the branches, very snake-like, surprisingly with how wolfish it looked. It turned its head and began growling at us, viciously, acting very violent and hostile. Now, we ran. We ran urgently, with remarkable speed back to our vehicles. We got inside and we cried and we hugged. Then, we called the police. We decided to call the local rangers, who thought we were just playing a joke. They dismissed us pretty quickly and even threatened us if we wasted their time again. We would all be facing charges. All three of us to this day have vivid nightmares about the incident. We cannot shake off this distress and trauma that came along with this exposure to this creature. We know we witnessed something that was spooky, and we all feel grateful to be alive this day. Perhaps if this story gets far enough, someone will have seen this creature too. Or, we could submit this story to maybe environmentalists who can visit the park, find out if there are any truth to it. If it is just me who saw it, I'd be able to accept I'm crazy. But this was three grown women, rational women, all with jobs who are confident we saw what appeared to be a dogman that's slithering around like a snake, straight out of hell. We were camping at Lost Creek Campgrounds, west of Atlantic, Mississippi. We had been there for two days, and my girlfriend and I decided to go on a little adventure, since we didn't know the area all that well. It was about midday when we first came upon it. About a hundred yards ahead of us, to our right, on the side of the track, was what we first thought was a regular dog. Most of it was just covered by trees, and it seemed to be lying down. We could clearly see a canine head and the start of its body. We both just stopped and stared over at it, not saying a word. You see, although my mind was desperately trying to convince me it was a regular dog, something looked very wrong with the whole picture. The thing is, you don't immediately think that you're going to see something that shouldn't exist, like some sort of monster, unless you don't know believe in those things. We were both very practical people, and never really cared for urban legends or even things like scary stories. After all, that's just child's play. 
right? Well, if I'd ever heard the long term dogman before, maybe I would have thought differently. I would have never ever for one moment considered that they could possibly exist. I turned my girlfriend and I said, Do you see that dog? And she looked at me, this look of utter terror that I had never seen before on her face, and just said, That isn't a dog. And sure enough, as we were still, just standing there, as if we had been rooted to the ground, this dog stood up. It's hard to explain what exactly was going through my mind when we saw it stand, not on a four legs, but two, like a human. There was no way this large, actual dog had somehow perfected standing on its hind legs. The entire body and even its limbs were like that of a man. Again, if this human body had been naked and maybe hairless, then I would have covered my girlfriend's eyes. I thought there was some kinky stuff going on out there, but despite having the shape of a man's body, it was indeed covered in fur, just like an animal. It looked super lean and muscly. It couldn't have been a costume, not a furry like I thought it was at first. Even though we weren't super close, we could instead see regular hands and feet at the end of human-looking limbs. But I looked closer. They were actually human-like paws. I say human because they were somewhere between a hand and a paw. Think like a raccoon's hands. It walked slowly up from the trees on the side of the track and stood there, facing us in the middle of the dirt road. It didn't make a sound. It didn't move towards us. It just stared. And then I heard this terrible low rumbling and realized to my terror this was growling and it was slowly retracting its lips, exposing its jagged, disgusting bare teeth. Having grown up with actual dogs, I knew this to be a warning sign. One that I knew meant run, which we did all the way back to camp where we packed up our stuff and left and not a second sooner. I've been around dogs all my life and I have no idea what it was we saw that night. But I do know that I never want to see it again. This is a true story of my experience with an unknown canid creature in the woods of Northern California. My first encounter ever happened late one evening when I was out camping at Lake Davis, just north of Sacramento in the Deptford area. I'd wanted to spend some time on my own after going through a particularly bad breakup. Although I was okay, my friends and family had been bombarding me with messages. I was just feeling overwhelmed and needed to be off the grid for a few days at a time. I'd loved camping, and nature as a kid. It seemed that was the perfect mini getaway. No electronics, just me, nature, and a good paperback. Although I'd made a snap decision to head out, I had done some research and asked about when buying the tent and equipment to make sure I was not heading into bear or cougar country. This is how I was pretty certain that the scratching and snuffling I could hear it wasn't one of those, at least. Of course, it was the woods, and full of all sorts of terrible critters, all going about their business, and I was the intruder. Still, as I was inside the tent listening, I didn't quite feel brave enough to open up the zipper and use the flash to see what was out there. Sure enough, in the morning, there were scratches all over one of the real big trees near the tent. Deep scratches that seemed too far up to be the small forest floor type critter. The tree also stank of urine, really strong as if every animal around had been using it as a potty. Whatever had been there, making those marks and peeing everywhere, had been marking its territory for sure. Whilst I wasn't scared, I was unnerved, mainly by the size of whatever had visited, or the strength if it had been able to pull itself up to make the scratches at man height. I forgot about it mostly through the daytime, and it wasn't until I lay down inside the tent again for the night when I began to wonder about the creature. As if on cue, I heard the scratching, 
and this time what sounded like sniffling right by the opening. I had the flashlight next to me, so I shone it towards the zipper and heard what seemed to be a yelp. Whatever was out there was also casting a shadow way bigger than I would have liked to. I almost considered packing up that morning as well as a part of me that was anxiously thinking that, hell, whatever that thing is, whatever it could be, part of me was thinking, wait, what could it be? What was that thing? I knew I had to stay one more night and try to find out. So that night, instead of fully closing the zipper and lying down, I pulled it too loosely shut so I could open it fast and sat right next to the opening, flashlight ready. As soon as I heard the creature, I would jump out with the flash and find out what it was, once and for all. Around midnight, I heard that now familiar sound of snuffling and scratching, and sure enough, it seemed to come right up close to the tent again, like the night before. This time, of course, I was ready, and I jumped out, pointing the flash down toward the ground, which was, of course, where I expected the creature to be. Well, there were feet and legs, but as I slowly moved the flashlight up, getting more and more anxious, thinking actually this was a really bad idea, I realized this was no animal. Not in the traditional way, anyway. I heard stories of dogmen. I think I'd seen a thread on Reddit once or something similar and thought the people must either be crazy or liars. It couldn't possibly be an actual thing. Nature wouldn't allow it. And yet, as I finished moving the flashlight upwards so I could see this monstrosity in full, I knew those people had been telling the truth. It was around my height, so six feetish and covered in really dark hair, or I guess fur, like covered completely. It stood up straight, like a person, so the legs weren't bowed like a dog, and it had long, gangly arms, too. The face was just like something of a German shepherd. I have to say, despite being absolutely terrified by the mere existence of this thing, it did not appear threatening, and it did not try to attack me. In fact, after I just stood gawking at it for a moment, it ran off. It didn't matter, though. I threw myself back into the tent, zipping it up, as if somehow the fabric would protect me, and sat there all night with the flashlight on me, jumping in every cricket, chirp, until the sun came up, and I could pack up and get out of there. One of the scariest things about this whole ordeal was that if these dogman creatures are real, when they don't even seem remotely possible, what else is out there? It makes me never want to step into the woods or go somewhere secluded again. All these horror movies where people go camping and get killed off by hillbillies, they got it wrong. It's the cryptids you have to look out for. Because if I could come across a dogman as big as a man, that might mean that Bigfoot, the Jersey Devil, the Mothman, they could all be very real. Years ago, while hunting up in the mountains, we heard this strange noise that we can't exactly identify. We're pretty experienced hunters, and the one thing you learn very early on are the various noises of animals, and any particular predators that you'd probably want to stay away from. The only thing this sound reminded me of was the next door's dog, who was a nasty son of a gun, having bitten one of the kids, and now had to be locked up at all times when the kids were not at school. This was the same kind of warning. But there was no good reason why any dog of any size would be out there, and we hadn't seen any other trucks or signs of another party. My dad and brothers didn't seem to have heard or taken much notice. They were busy. I was fully equipped with a shotgun, and I decided to head over towards the rustling to see what was out there. The first thing I noticed as I got close were the leaves and the branches around my own height seemed to be moving, so I was even more certain that this couldn't be a dog, since it must be something that could climb. It never crossed my mind for one instant 
that it could be a dog the size of a man. As ridiculous as that sounds. I've heard tales of them creatures, but they were more like campfire tales. Like the hookman and the dude that licks your hand under the bed. They weren't real. Couldn't be. And as I edged closer to the bushes, I could make out the rough shape of what was in there. But it didn't seem to make any sense. It couldn't be something that big unless it was another person. I had the shotgun ready, my finger on the trigger, as something just didn't feel right. A hunter's instinct. Still, I stupidly felt that I wanted to deal with this alone. Maybe prove something to my dad, since it was almost always him or one of my brothers that brought home the prize. I didn't want to look like I was afraid, so I edged closer. I kept crepping forward as to not spook it. Then, there it was, in my full sight. I think I stared at it for about a full minute before I took a shot, just in complete shock at this thing. That alerted the others, of course, and they came running over. I stood there for a moment, unable to tell them what I saw. My eldest brother headed off into the brush to see if I'd even hit it. It seems that I did not, and there was no creature not to be seen nor blood on the ground. But I don't know how I could have missed. They were all talking at once, and I was trying to tell them by yelling. It was a dog, but not a dog. Like a man, but a dog as big as a man. To this day, they still tease me about it. My brothers even joke that I saw a werewolf. But I know what I saw. It was the strange creature, but not as giant as I would think. Like a dire wolf or something. This thing was like the body of a man but the head of a dog. At least, I'd like to think so. And I believe it's still out there somewhere. <laughs>